We can still hear on your end, Rob. I hear something. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Pullman City Council meeting. It's uh, seven o'clock, and it's uh, nice to have all of you here by uh, virtually here, so to speak. And we've got our council members here as well. It's Tuesday, April 28th. <coughs> Deep Styles, would you please take roll? Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Johnson. Present. Council Member Chapman. Present. Council Member McCall. Here. Council Member Parks. Here. <clears throat> Council Member Records. Here. Council Member Sorensen. Here. Council Member Weller. With that, uh, under announcements tonight, uh, your Pullman community, government, education, business, and individual residents. Council Pullman Member Wright. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Here. I got to the W's and didn't, okay, all right. Thank you, Dee. Do we need to excuse Nathan? I have not received any message from him at this point. Okay. Unless anybody else has. And I sent him a text, so I haven't heard anything from him. So with that, we'll go to announcements tonight. Your Pullman Community Government Education Business Individual Residents pulling expertise and energies to take care of Pullman. Together we're strong and we'll weather the storm. And the latest updates go to uh, PullmanWA.gov and check on the red banner called COVID-19 or alerts and updates for quick links. Good news is that Pullman businesses are working to serve you while maximizing social distance. Pullman Chamber of Commerce has a COVID-19 information resource at PullmanChamber.com, which includes updates on Pullman restaurant delivery, takeout options, as well as Pullman retail and other businesses. You can support your Pullman restaurants. You can check out Foodie Bingo coming soon and sponsored by your Pullman radio stations. With the help of Neil Library Director Joanna Bailey and our IT department, Neil Library's youth librarian, Miss Rachel, and I are recording a series of story times that can be accessed through the city website at PullmanWA.gov under Neil Library. Thrift stores and landfills are closed to the general public during COVID crisis. Students are starting to move out, want to dispose of furnishings and household goods. So for these and other issues, you can contact the Pullman Disposal Service at 334-1914 to figure out a plan for removal of refuse, furniture, and recycling. Pullman Disposal can pick up furniture if necessary. The other alternative, according to Pullman Disposal Service, is that people get an account with a transfer station and make arrangements to drop off items there. I was notified by Scott Adams this afternoon, a lot of us on the mailing list, that Pullman Regional Hospital is teaming up with Insight Diagnostics to bring 24-hour testing to our patients, including surgical and obstetrical patients. This testing arrangement will start tomorrow, April 29th. Insight Diagnostics has been a longtime partner with Pullman Regional Hospital, and the interface framework and courier service are already in place, which should allow for a smooth transition for COVID-19 testing. The instrument being used is the same instrument used at the University of Washington, what they use for testing, the system offers up to 380 tests in an eight hour period. Testing is performed in about a two to three hour period from the placing of the sample in that machine. So that's good news to get uh, testing results a little bit quicker than we've had in the past. With that, we have a number of presentations tonight. And first of all, we'll start with an emergency management update from Pullman Police Chief Gary Jenkins, our emergency coordinator. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, so we are still at uh, 16 positive cases in Whitman County, uh, according to the Whitman County Department of Health. 12 of those have recovered, uh, four are still isolating at home. Um, of note, one of the last couple of uh, positive tests was from a patient who was uh, asymptomatic. And that person was tested uh, as a result of an investigation by the Department of Health uh, of people who had been in contact with those who had tested positive. And so this person was completely asymptomatic, but did come back with a positive test. 
uh, the Department of Health does tell us that they will be uh, providing more tests and it sounds like it, as early as the next week, they'll be doing a lot more local testing at Washington State University. And they'll also be conducting uh, tests of first responders who are asymptomatic as well. Uh, we're, we are tracking uh, expenses for FEMA reimbursements. Uh, Deputy Fire Chief Ray Lamoureux is coordinating the tracking of those expenses and has actually already put in for some reimbursements. Uh, right now we sit at about $14,600 of expenses that we have either submitted or are pending of submittal for uh, reimbursements. And some of that is for supplies, uh, some is for fire overtime, and uh, some of it was for public works to make changes to their break room to accommodate uh, social distancing. Uh, police and fire departments have both established uh, employee and visitor screening protocols where temperatures are taken uh, of persons before they enter the facilities. And if it's uh, over a, a certain amount, then they're denied entry. Um, so far at the police department, we have had uh, not had any staff that have been impacted by uh, COVID-19. Also at the police department, we have uh, devised 12-hour uh, shifts for our patrol and code enforcement, which uh, splits them up into smaller work groups and also uh, creates a situation where we do not have any shift overlap. So we are trying to mitigate as much as possible any potential um, infection from one person that could infect uh, a number of people at our department. We're still seeing a lot of uh, calls for potential proclamation violations. Since March 26 to the present, we've responded to about 55 calls. Most of those have been uh, reports of potential social distancing violations or gatherings such as parties uh, and in some cases soccer games. Uh, frisbee um, at the park uh, and we've uh, received a few construction uh, calls which now those are being referred to uh, the state website uh, and then just a few miscellaneous calls so um, uh, we're still responding to those uh, we haven't had a call uh, of a possible violation in the past couple of days uh, but we still get uh, a number each week um, we did receive a uh, complaint from the state website uh, regarding a potential violation uh, with transit regarding social dis distancing. Uh, I contacted Wayne Thompson and he provided me uh, a number of uh, photos and documents uh, to show what they are doing to uh, enforce so social distancing on uh, Pullman Transit. And so after an investigation of that, uh, I classified that as an unfounded complaint. Um, through the Whitman County uh, Emergency Operations Center, uh, Pullman entities uh, have been receiving, requested and receiving supplies that are needed. Uh, the entities that have received supplies through uh, the county and the state have been Pullman Police, Pullman Fire, Pullman Airport Fire, uh, Washington State University Police, Pullman Regional Hospital, and 20 different long-term long care facilities. Uh, and items that have been uh, requested and received have been uh, over 9,400 uh, N95 masks, uh, 3,000 surgical masks, almost 300 cloth masks, uh, some face shields, uh, surgical gowns, hand sanitizer, goggles, uh, coveralls and safety glasses. Um, right now, uh, we're able to get most everything that we need through the state with the exception of the disposable gowns. Those are still a little bit hard to come by and we're only receiving a percentage of uh, the requests made. Um, so that's my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have a question, Gary. Yes, sir. Um, of the... Uh... Tests that have uh, occurred in Whitman County and the uh, positive tests, uh, do we know that all of those are residents of Whitman County or any of them from outside of our county? We're not getting any specific information about, uh, about the patients themselves. Um, I'm led to believe that 
because I have heard that uh, there have been some positive tests of people that were not residents of Whitman County. And so those numbers were excluded from the count. So that leads me to believe that all of the positive tests that we're hearing about right now are Whitman County residents. Okay, I, I had heard the same thing. So I just wanted to make sure that our, our numbers for Whitman County are, are really truly Whitman County numbers. Thank right, you. that's my understanding. Any other questions of Gary? And I know Dee has noted that Nathan's with us right now, so thank you very much. Uh, if no other questions, we'll go to uh, Jennifer Hackman, Economic Development Update. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council. I'm going to share some slides. Tonight, I'm going to update you on the mobilization efforts of the city and our partners as we have moved through this evolving COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to discuss some activities from the time of the governor's stay healthy, stay home order on March 23rd through today and how businesses are being affected. I will share the kinds of outreach, communication, assistance that has been taking place, discuss monitoring and collaboration, and finally current conditions with some thoughts on recovery. Um, these are all occurring not really in a linear way, but uh, more in a circular format, almost kind of like Groundhog Day. Um, throughout all of these efforts, um, I try to stay focused on what the businesses are needing and what they are asking for. And uh, I am also just um, blown away with this community and how much we are supporting our businesses and businesses supporting each other and really how resilient um, they are being as we go through this. And I look forward to your comments um, following this and continued collaboration. When the stay at home order was announced, I established a working group of colleagues who um, continue to get on a weekly call on Wednesdays to share information and to coordinate steps to be taken. Some of these partners have included um, Suida and currently include Avista, the University, the Downtown Pullman Association, the Chamber, CAC, and SEL. Uh, initially, we agreed that a survey would be helpful, and so Suida created one based on recommended language from the Washington Economic Development Association. It was widely promoted and many, many Pullman businesses responded. I have not received a report. Um, however, I do know that subsequent emergency grants resulted from that survey and um, responses were treated like applications. And I'll share some of those results in a couple of minutes. We also created a COVID-19 related um, business resources and information page on the city's website, which we do continue to update. I create the content and um, that comes in from various resources as well. And then I get help from Morgan Sherwood, Darby Baldwin and Kristen Reisenhower um, on updating the actual page. Um, the city page is not the only page with information. And on our page, we do refer to other pages um, like the governor's coronavirus page and, and other partners. And people get information from different places. And so I think it's important that the city also provide good information to our business community. We also um, will be doing and have been doing um, social media content as appropriate on our various platforms. Many direct calls have been made to businesses, especially sole proprietors. And I've also made calls myself and also with the assistance of our WSU intern, Casey King, and also several other WSU students from WSU executive chef, Jamie Callison's classes, who all volunteered to make contact with businesses. Um, and I do wanna note that Avista really did a lot to help make that possible by providing a complete business list so that we could reach as many businesses in Pullman as possible, not just those from the various um, organizations that are partners. I also created a MailChimp account and initiated an ongoing email newsletter of COVID-19 related information. That was not a simple task, um, just due to, to marketing and compliance laws. 
um, I needed to send out my first email somewhat manually, which I did to several hundred contacts. And then from there and ongoing, I'm taking those who subscribed to that email and going forward. Um, in addition, our downtown coordinator and chamber have also forwarded some of my messages directly to their subscription lists and with the offer to subscribe. So I'm hoping to continue to grow this list. And um, this situation is fluid, so there has been no, um, no, there's been a lot of content to um, get out in a timely manner to businesses. Um, I want to thank um, Al Sorensen, who called me with a recommendation to include as many banks as we had information about their actual policies with this last round of PPP, since that was just changing on a almost daily basis how banks individually were able to handle um, PPP requests and that's the Paycheck Protection Program and those loans. So we have been doing that and I um, would invite any council members with ideas for content based on what they're hearing from constituents and businesses. Um, please let me know. I'll be happy to include that in the emails. So we have had some grants that were available from the state and also locally. SAWIDA itself gave out about 27 emergency mitigation grants. I don't have the amounts, but I do know that seven Pullman businesses did receive some kind of grant locally. And also the Working Washington grants were made available by the governor. Initially, the fund was set up as five, for $5 million for the entire state. And recently it was doubled to about $10 million. Um, I know that about 140 Pullman businesses applied for that grant. Um, it has not been given, uh, awards have not been made, but to date there are over 1,100 in the approval pipeline with funds expected to start reaching businesses in May. So there have been various loan programs also made available, available from the federal government and the Paycheck Protection Program and the Emergency Injury um, Disaster Loan are two of those. Our, our banks have done uh, an enormous amount of loans. Um, I know that Washington Trust alone lent over 1.1 billion in its region, which does extend beyond Pullman, but um, Eastern Washington is, is, is really the basic region of um, Washington Trust. And Washington Federal closed over 250 million in their region, and they were able to tell me that over 40 businesses in Pullman applied for lo loans with them. Of course, I've been um, making one-on-one -on -one calls with individual businesses and also referring them to um, different um, advisors as, as appropriate. Um, some of those include the SBDC, and also um, Pullman Marketing, um, which does a lot with uh, digital marketing and offered one-on-one -on -one calls with a lot of our retailers and any restaurants who are interested in understanding how to go more online. And that's, that's gonna be something that may stick and may be with us even as we come out of this crisis, that people change their habits and how they shop. And so we're looking for um, additional ways to get that technical expertise out to our businesses. In addition to that, um, we have been doing quite a few webinars um, and, and some of these again are technical um, in nature and content and have been led by the SBDC and also by Pullman Marketing and, and we have been communicating those out to businesses. Those have been fairly popular with about 42 participants on an average webinar and some of them um, as high as 70 to 100 in um, attendance. So our businesses are certainly um, learning and um, figuring out what is available, how they can continue to exist throughout this crisis. And then I know that we do have some CDBG funding that will be coming our way. And um, it is a little bit up in the air exactly how that funding is going to be delegated out to various um, individuals, but it will include some funding for businesses. So I will be coming back with more information about that later. Of course, throughout this crisis, 
our hospitality, retail, services, and restaurant businesses have been hit really hard. And I want to just share um, one or two stories of them, um, just to give you a sense of um, how proud we can be of our businesses. Um, one of these businesses is a sole proprietor who owns Monroe Men's and Rockstar Body Bar on Grand Avenue. And um, so Ruthanna Willie and her husband are, I mean, they are passionate, they are go-getters, and they are some of those positive people and, and so tenacious. Um, when her store was closed, um, she was really stuck. Um, she had a baby who just got out of the hospital. Um, she has these two businesses and that is the only income coming in. And um, she told me that there were moments that, you know, she just didn't know how she was gonna make it through the next day. Um, but in our conversations, she was open to every um, piece of advice I gave her, every referral, and she began reorienting her business immediately to go completely online. She didn't waste a single day. Um, and so I know that she also had been trying to apply for our unemployment and the PPP and the IDLE, um, and it's been a rough go, it really has. But I did um, talk to her today and she received both the IDLE um, a couple of days ago, and she also received um, acknowledgement that her PPP is coming through today. So at this point, um, she told me, you know, I don't know what May is going to look like. I don't expect May to really get better, but, um, but she has hope. And um, I'm, I'm really proud of those stories. I know that there are, uh, this is just one business, but it replicates so many other businesses that are feeling the same kind of pain and making it through. Um, I received another acknowledgement from another business I was, I was working with today who um, also got their paycheck, um, paycheck Protection Program and um, were very, very thankful and said, you know, we can stop the downward slide and start the track to recover. Um, so that and, and our restaurants have really been um, hurt as well, but some of them have responded amazingly with um, giving out to the community. One of our restaurants shared with me that they received $10,000 in a donation and they were able to translate that due to their, um, the relationships that they have with their own suppliers into uh, $40,000 worth of meals for Pullman. So I'm, I'm really um, just taken away with, um, taken back with, with all of the support in our community. I mentioned the partner calls already, um, and those are important to stay up to date with information and sharing, and also to um, begin to think about um, laying the groundwork for recovery. Um, but also it's important that we are monitoring and collaborating um, amongst, you know, with the university especially, um, who, you know, will be affected and we want to stay connected to them and on top of their decisions as well as well as look for opportunities, which there may be as we go. Also state commerce and um, the WIDA updates, national industry groups, and then I've been on IEDC webinars, SBA webinars, um, and, Ash and National League of City webinars to try to understand how others are dealing with this crisis and looking forward to um, how they plan to recover and some of the trends that um, folks think may be coming. Just want to share some of the current conditions in commercial and residential and I want to thank Kimberly Haygood um, for providing some of this information um, as well as Stacey Overton. Um, these are just the commercial and residential current trends um, and, and with the commercial it's just those properties that are for sale. Um, so this may change um, I don't expect student housing to change. I have, um, I, I understand that there is some foreign um, investment that wants to move forward with student housing projects. So I expect those to continue. And I do think that we should encourage and continue housing construction as, as we go along here. And then just to give you a sense of the unemployment, the total number, uh, number of initial unemployment claims from the middle of March 
to the week before last, there's a week lagging, is about 1,603. Um, but we are lucky, actually, um, that our export businesses have remained stable. Um, both SEL and VMRD were hiring about 30 positions each. I know that Meter Group is also stable. And so one of the bigger impacts is going to be coming from you know, with what happens with the university going through the summer and going into the fall. So we'll, we'll wanna stay monitoring that um, because that is likely to have some um, ripple, effect, um, ripple effects. Um, but our export-based businesses, including Heinrichs Trading that I've worked with and others, um, have been able to remain stable for now. So much of what happens next will be dependent on factors outside of our control. Um, although I know that we are advocating, I know the mayor has been advocating on our behalf at the state level, and there are there may be other opportunities for us to do that as well. But here are just some, some trends to be thinking about um, and that I will be thinking about. Um, as I mentioned before, some of the transitions that businesses are making right now may wind up sticking. And so um, for those businesses that hadn't yet um, gotten all of their uh, information online and uh, to a great extent some of their products online, um, that will likely, I think that's gonna continue. And so if you know we can help our businesses um, with that technical ex expertise of going online and marketing online, I, I think that'll be beneficial. Um, and also, um, as we go on here, there may be some shifts in how people think about where they're living. Um, I think we have an opportunity to advertise and market our town to remote workers because of our high quality of life. And I think it makes all the sense in the world to keep doing what we're doing to encourage um, those, those assets. Um, there probably will be people looking to start businesses at this time. And, um, making sure that we plan to assist entrepreneurs is also important. And I'm pleased that the Palouse Knowledge Corridor is going to be holding a class online in June for um, both students and also community members who are interested in exploring their, uh, their business ideas. And then of course we know um, from the governor that there will be recommendations for each industry um, to be brought back um, into recovery. And there may be changes that, that occur permanently um, or semi-permanently with them as well. So we'll be listening for those and looking to learn what we can and help other businesses in those industries um, going forward. And so with that, um, I'd like love to hear any comments, questions, or discussion. And since we have a split screen, please uh, identify yourself when you ask the question. Hi, this is, this is Pat. Hi, Pat. Um, sadly, I just heard today that we lost a downtown business, uh, the Daily Grind Coffee House. And now I shared with her employees last week and made it official today, I guess, that she is closing the coffee house downtown, not the drive-throughs, just downtown. So that's a that's a tough one, um, as is Sam's Apothecary, I guess, is closing as well. And that one is very sad because he just recently reopened in that location. So yeah. not you. sure if anybody had heard of, about those. Thank you, Pat. I knew about Sam's Apothecary because one of the owners moved and I do think the other owner is planning to um, bring that business back somewhat, but it may be moving to um, where she lives. Other questions or comments? Yeah, this is Brandon Chapman. Um, on Sam's, I think I just walked by there a couple of days ago and I think it was already empty. Um, so, you know, that's that's definitely a, a sad thing. Um, Jennifer, maybe you'll know, or maybe Mike Urban it can know, uh, in terms of this PPP, uh, now I heard that there was there were some issues with that in terms of uh, large banks that were not intended to uh, receive some of this. Um, 
uh, to funnel that to large companies, but some of that had been happening. And um, of course, it's known now, but, mm -hmm. but a lot of the anticipated benefits of that PPP had not initially re um, gone to the small businesses. And so there was supposed to be a course correction. And um, I don't know, I don't know if, uh, if I understood that correctly or not, but you, you might be able to shed some light on that. Thanks, um, Councilmember Chapman. Yes, I um, I do know that that was the case, and that with the second round of funding, that that was intended to be corrected somewhat. And I will also say that the experience of trying to get one of those loans um, for the first round was was pretty frustrating <laughs> for everyone involved, um, and it is going smoother um, this time around because businesses and banks. And lenders were able to get a little more prepared um, but yeah absolutely and I think it remains to be seen as to you know what what need remains out there um, after we get through this round we're just kind of in this the second day it started yesterday at 7 30 in the morning um, and there was a backlog that all the banks had um, so we're going to continue to monitor that and then advocate as as need be there was a push from the U.S. Conference of Mayors to get credit unions to be able to loan. Have you heard anything on that? Credit, I, yes, credit unions were able to loan. And in fact, I have heard from several businesses that were able to get their PPP through a credit union. This time around, not last time around, this time around. No, last time around, two of the biggest, Bank of America and Wells Fargo, people had terrible experiences with both of them because they closed off the applications the first day they got the money. Yeah. Other comments or questions of Jen? This is Ann. Uh, Jen, I just want to thank you for this really comprehensive report and to just compliment you on all the different points that you're you're trying to reach and all the just the different ways you're doing it. I think it's really important for people to know that even though we're, we're not visible, um, and especially the city staff, that you all are working very hard and very diligently. So I very much appreciate your attention to everything you're putting your energy toward. Thank you, Councilmember Parks. I will say that economic development is a team sport, <laughs> and um, we have some pretty good partners in this area. And um, and and I and I hope for continued and, and increasing partnership um, as we move through it forward. I think there are um, a, a lot of difficult, continued difficult days ahead. Some of the council members may have seen that Avista actually helped contribute to our economic development manager, correct? In, in terms of your program and what you're trying to do right now. I I do want to. I, I, Paul Kimmel is just wonderful <laughs> and it's wonderful to have him and, and other partners um, and volunteers too. Um, you know, I've collaborated with volunteers throughout this crisis. Um, we, we've had folks, you know, the Pullman Serves It Forward is a wonderful campaign that was started, um, you know, with, with um, Jamie Callison and um, the CAC and, um, and some of our other partners. And um, you know Justin Glover with Palouse Info. Um, you know we've been working together, so you know it's kind of an all hands on deck, which is you know really wonderful because that's what it's going to take. Jen, this is uh, Dan Records. Uh, I just wanted to, to comment and say thank you for the website, um, the resources that you put together on there, not just for Pullman, but the links you have to other statewide resources and federal resources. I've actually been contacted by, by several people from around the state of Washington asking about specific programs, specific grant or, or um, loan programs. And you know, one of the first things I do is, is ask them to review the website that, that you all put up um, because it's a, it's a good, you know, good way for them to get educated before we start talking about specific you know, situations that they're in. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you, Councilman Records. Mayor, Councilmember Wellers had his hand raised as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Glenn. Thank you, Adam, as well. Um, apologize for uh, uh, being late. Everybody in my neighborhood is on Wi-Fi. So in any case, um, I did want to uh, tell Jen, you know, I really appreciate you being involved in all the different businesses. PKC, of course, is a, 
uh, very interested in keeping everything moving forward. Um, so appreciate that. I'd like to recognize also the trainings that, that uh, the chamber has been involved in um, as well as uh, that they've been putting on. I know the Pullman Good Food Co-op, uh, they've been attending quite a few of those, um, but it's also important, and I think you already mentioned this, Jen, um, our entire community has, has come out to support businesses. Uh, I know as far as myself, I really had to diversify. My paintball business is, you know, you can't do much there. Um, and uh, going online with consulting is a, a something that should be encouraged uh, for other businesses if they can. Um, but lastly, I'd like to recognize uh, not only the other council members, uh, our staff, but also especially Brandon Chapman. Brandon has been out there um getting uh going to different businesses it's it's been huge i've watched it on facebook so thank you uh fellow council member chapman but jen you have just been awesome so thank you so much and uh keep it up i want to echo your thoughts there council member weller because i look at um Councilmember Chapman's Facebook and also learned about Palouse Info from uh, him. So that opened the door to allow me to connect with Justin and coordinate a little bit better. So I appreciate um, any and all of the council members and your efforts and please reach out to me anytime. Yeah, thank you. And Justin is just one example. We have several residents who uh, certainly would be willing to step up, step up if asked. But, but these are folks that weren't necessarily even asked. They just saw a need and they, they went forward and, and he is just one of uh, many that, that um, you know, maybe we had interacted with them before and, and some of them maybe we didn't, but now we don't, do know that we have uh, some person assets here that can, uh, can be uh, super beneficial to, uh, to us, both in recovery for, for the coronavirus and moving forward. So that's really um, awesome to see. So thank you. And lastly, I'll just say, yep, we can get these at the chamber, <laughs> these ones and other stickers. So please go out and get yourself a, you know, we are in this together. We are Pullman strong. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate also that the, the um, that Pullman police is doing a campaign um, for apparel that will um, with college um, hill frets as well. Any others? Okay, Jen, thank you so much. We appreciate it. I uh, sit on a uh, economic, Washington Economic Recovery Coalition out of, the, it's out of the Seattle area and was online on Thursday. I have another meeting coming up this week. And it's interesting to hear how the different associations are addressing the governor and coming up with the plans to try and get their businesses back at it again. And one of them was from the, the restaurants, actually the Hospitality Association, and they're actually laying out to the governor right now that we only use 60% of our space and all tables will be six, uh, six feet apart. And they've already tried to work out all the social distancing so they can get back in business as quick as they possibly can. And that's one of the things that construction did. They, they had that plan. I actually heard from Senator Schessler. They had the plan on the governor's desk well over like several weeks before it was finally announced but they came up with a plan to take care of and make sure everybody's safe. And that's what the associations have done. And that's great to see this kind of cooperation locally as well. So thank you so much for that. Next uh, is a financial update from Mike Urban. Mike, you're muted. That worked. Hi, let's try that again. So good evening, Council. Um, unfortunately, I can't see all of you at once. And you know, as I like to present, I always like it when the questions go back and forth. Uh, so since I can't see you and raising your hands, I'm just going to pause in between each slide and see if there's any questions. And uh, a lot like the last, if you could just uh, um, say who's asking the question, so you jump up onto my screen. We'll we'll just tackle this kind of slide by slide. 
I went for brevity today on this, seven slides, so we'll uh, work through this as uh, quickly and thoroughly as we can. So starting out uh, for the financial update, I just really, we're, we're gonna be focusing on the general fund. Um, tonight, we're just, uh, a lot of the items that are in the general fund are leading indicators for other funds. So if people are paying sales tax, they're probably paying their utility bills and those types of things. So uh, some of the volatility revenues in here, obviously the sales tax, we talk about that very consistently. That's something I started doing when I arrived is giving you those monthly reports. Uh, admissions tax, fees for services, and I think there's some volatility in property taxes. And as I get through some of these um, slides, I'll get into that a little bit more. So just as a reminder, and for some of the folks tuning in, the general fund bucket, these dollars, this is what supports um, police, fire, library, parks, recreation, finance and administration. This is not uh, dollars for public works. That's Those are different sort of revenues for different sort of activities. So we're really kind of focusing on these items tonight. So before I go on to the next slide, any questions? Okay. And there we go. Okay, so we're gonna start to uh, just touch on the legislation. And some of this will be redundant from what uh, Chief Jenkins and certainly Jennifer brought up. Uh, we're just gonna talk about the CARES Act really quick because this is the big dollar thing. Uh, gonna zero you in on the second bullet point where some of this funding that's going to local governments, it's, it's only for things that aren't in the municipality's budget before this happened. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of uh, relaxation on that, and I'll talk about that as we go a little bit, but a lot of these uh, grants that we see coming out of this, it, it underlines and bolds, and it says, if this was in your budget before 3-1, like uh, loss in revenues, that's not something that they're looking at doling out dollars for. With the CARES Act, uh, Smaller municipalities under 500,000 needed to wait for the dollars to be distributed to the state, where larger municipalities uh, over half a million could apply directly to for the CARES Act. The good news is we did get word within the last 24 hours that the state is looking to do distributions of these dollars to uh, the locals. They have set a floor that each county will be getting $250,000 and each city will be getting at least $25,000. They're going through the internal state processes right now to see who's gonna get more. Nobody will get less according to what we've been reading. Um, and then they gotta push it by the legislators to get some other T's crossed and I's dotted. But uh, that, that's been some good news for us in the last 24 hours. If you see some of these other entities that are getting dollars as well, uh, one I wanna really point out is the 25 billion that went to the Federal Transit Administration. Those dollars actually got, a lot of those got turned around to the state level and we did get word that uh, we'll be getting over a million dollars from Washington DOT, but it's not here's your million dollars, go spend it, it's up to, and how we're gonna to have to do the um, tracking and all of that. That's good and that's great news, but this is my opportunity again to remind you that those transit dollars live in that transit bucket and they're not a general fund bucket. But that, when I looked at uh, some of the uh, items that you can do with those transit dollars, it was the first time I saw some loosening up of the language of if it wasn't previously in your budget, it's still gotta be COVID related, but they may be looking at some things that they're willing to do more of. So as the official words come down, we'll know more. But right now, the, the big thing to discuss is the fact that there's, there's money up here for um, CDBG grant, as uh, Jen mentioned in hers. There's money for small business. There's money for schools. There's money for PPE. The FAA has money. There's just really not much designated where they're going to municipalities and say, hey, we know you have a revenue shortfall here. That's, we just haven't seen that yet in these. Um, are there any questions on this one before I go on to the next slide? Okay. 
So a little bit more on the legislation, uh, the FFCRA, a lot of people just call it families first. This is where the federal government came out and said, if you have a slowdown in your work, we're gonna give you 80 hours of emergency sick leave. Um, if you have to um, take care of somebody with COVID symptoms, you have COVID symptoms here, here's 80 hours. We're gonna expand the FMLA benefits as well. One of the little asterisks to that particular item is that private employers are eligible for tax credit to offset these costs. No such luck for municipalities. So these dollars as they went out, they stayed out, it's just a cost to the city. As Chief Jenkins mentioned, uh, there's some FEMA dollars coming our way, all COVID-19 related. So if we have some ramp up expenses, we can get reimbursed on that. The SBA has a couple different programs, most prominently the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. And Jen did a really nice job of touching on the PVP that that just did reopen um, and how that played through. So as I look through these legislation items, you know, I have a couple concerns. It's things that, you know, we, if you keep printing money, then there's a kind of nasty side effect that uh, economists will tell you about, and that's inflation. So I'm, I'm keeping my eye on that warily. I mentioned earlier, there's really no direct help for smaller municipalities. Um, maybe some will be on the way, but as it stands right now, we're, we're on our own. Uh, 25,000 is nice, we'll certainly put it to work, but when your expense budget is 25 million, it's, it's a drop. I'm concerned about rev revenue collections in the general fund, and I'm gonna touch on that on the next slide a little bit deeper. But um, yeah, any questions on this slide before I move on? Mike? Yep. This is Dan. Um, have, have we seen? Dan, I lost your audio. Am I the only one? No, we lost it. It sounded like he pulled a plug from his mic, perhaps. Push it in. but we're not hearing him. Dan, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, buddy. So take, take a look at your hookups there and then when you, you got it back, just yell it. I'll stop on the next slide because there's there's a lot of good places to stop on it, okay? Is this is this working now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Well, just plug it, unplug it, plug it back in, works great. Um, <laughs> I was just going to ask, uh, have we seen much in terms of employees using some of these uh, expanded leave provisions? Yes. Okay. Yeah. To date, we have, um, and bear in mind, we got another payroll closing at the end of this week. Um, to date, the city has paid out $21,475 in gross wages towards the 80-hour uh, families first. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I think those those provisions are definitely necessary for our employees to be able to you know, take care of the things they need to take care of and be able to come back to work. So I appreciate that they're there, but it is it is helpful to keep in mind what, what that does to our budget. So thank you. Okay. No problem. All right, next slide. So this is kind of my sobering moment on the timeline of activities because I remember us being all together on March 10th and we we're starting to have these discussions and I had one presentation and then it changed when we met again on the 17th and the 31st and here we are again today and it's just this evolving and devolving thing all at once so um, you know we had the meeting on the 10th we woke up the next morning and things just started going differently so uh, we jumped on some department head budget meetings we started those the 12th we finished them on Sunday the 15th so we can brief council on some moves we were gonna make. We kept meeting with departments, we keep briefing. And then just this last week, we did a second round of uh, budget meetings to really get everybody to sharpen their pencil. Uh, Cause we want to look at everything and anything because depending on the depth and the breadth of this, we wanna, we wanna know what the plan is and just keep adjusting as we go. Hopefully things don't get to be their worst. We're always hoping for the best. But in, in case we, uh, there's other cities that are just starting to do this right now. And we're, we're pretty far ahead. So I'm, I'm very pleased that the department heads came to, you know, 
as a group and said, okay, we'll, we'll look at our items and try to weather this together. So talking about next steps here, I wanna kind of touch on sales tax and property tax really from a timing issue, because there's been a lot of confusion on that lately. And this is a good chance to um, you know, inform the public as well. So with sales tax, um, I was asked why I can't get put the sales tax numbers together sooner, and it's, I, I wish I could. So really the way sales tax boils down for our businesses is the month closes, April ends here on Thursday. The people that pay monthly have until the 25th of May to turn around and submit their reports and their dollars to the state of Washington. State of Washington takes another 30 days, turns them around, and then relays that to us at the end of June. So when we talk about this two month lag, that's why there's a two month lag. It's not sitting there wasting away on my desk. It's we're, we're waiting and we're excited to download and inform council and the mayor as to what's going on with our sales tax rates. So March, as you remember, we were open for the first part of it. If you look at the timeline here, so March's numbers will be down but it's, there was a little bit of activity. April's numbers will look quite a bit different. And then there's another reason April's numbers will look quite a bit different is that um, some businesses pay quarterly on their Department of Revenue taxes because they haven't hit a certain threshold. So January through March due on April 30th. Those quarterly returns have been given an extension now till the end of June. So what we would have normally seen in May, we're, we're not gonna see now until July. So there's, there's another kind of postponement of revenues to the city as well. So that's just a touch on sales tax and why there's a two month lag. I just wanna talk about property tax for a little bit too, because there's a little lag there as well. It's not, as bad as I thought when I first built this slide because I ran some numbers, but uh, I do have a concern. Um, property taxes are due the 30th of April, 31st of October, and all the dollars that are collected in April are remitted back to the city by the county treasurer 10th of May. And then all the items that are collected in May, 10th of June. And why that's important is, is if people are holding dollars and we're not sure what this looks like yet, if they're sending that check in on the absolute last day of April to pay their property taxes, to keep their cash flow as good as they can, it's still on time because it's postmarked in April, but it's received in May by the treasurer's office. They have to process it and check off their account. And then we don't get those dollars until June. So if there's a lot of people holding them until late, we won't know that for really another month. So I just want to let council know about mid-May because usually 10 days into it, the treasurer's office should have a good idea of what is rolled in. So I'm planning on calling Chris Nelson up there and getting an idea of what's allotted to us at that point in the day and see how that goes. If property taxes come in as normal, I think we can ease off on some of the real concerns that I have. If people are holding that and willing to pay the penalty and uh, pay the property tax later in the year, and there is some programs through the county treasurer's office for this, then it might have some more impacts on our budget as the summer goes on. So, you know, sales tax and property tax are our two biggest revenue funds for the general fund. So with that, we're gonna keep uh, looking at these dollars and keep forecasting, and we're just gonna keep forecasting, keep forecasting, and uh, you know, hopefully we can get from a forecast of this to a forecast of this. Love to get to a forecast of this, but I, I'm, this is my goal for the day. And just work through that, and then just keeping council appraised of what's going on with that particular activity. So before I move to the next slide, are there any questions on this one? Mike, this is Dan again. Hi, Dan. Um, you know, we saw that there is some additional money coming in through FAA um, to the airport. Um, and is that, what, what's the impact to our budget on, on that change of going from a match to, 
you know, mostly funding the whole project. Were we anticipating spending some money uh, for that match um, in, in current budget, or, or is that something that we were looking at the next budget or? Honestly, it was the next budget. Okay. 21, 22, um, next budget and, uh, but not having that current match is a huge relief because they, uh, FAA doesn't reimburse uh, terminals the way they do for landing. Hey Mike, this is Brandon Chapman. Uh, can I ask you a question in terms of um, money that might be loaned to the airport? Uh, I don't know if it's a bridge loan or, or anything else until they receive money from the FAA. So um, how much have we normally had it set aside to, uh, to do that kind of thing? And, um, and how much do we have right now? I would want to double check the now numbers. I think I could shoot a number at you, but it's, I, I think I would be inaccurate. So I owe uh, council an email after this meeting, I'll go into Eden, which I can access remotely and give you that number. Um, I know we've turned in a lot of um, requests for reimbursements to the FAA and they've been catching up very rapidly um, with us to get some of those um, loans that we've been bridging. And really that's the best answer, best way to explain it. Um, so I, I, I know we are way under the threshold. There was a time where uh, council did take action before I arrived here. And I believe that threshold is we can loan them up to $10 million out of the utility fund to bridge and keep them going. We are not anywhere near that. Um, I, I don't want to speculate in an open meeting here, but I will get you those. That's fine. Numbers. I think yeah, I know. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And again, utility for the viewing audience, those utility dollars do not affect general fund. It's a different bucket of dollars. We have to, you know, use those dollars for those things. It's proper accounting rules. It's proper with GAP, GASB, and RCW. You don't want to commingle funds. It's the fastest way to ask for an audit finding. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. We're getting there. Okay, so the financial picture. Really what we're looking at as a city right now is, you get, I hope you remember the 2020 budget was originally balanced on the reserves of $1.65 million. So revenue, expected revenues was 1.65 million less than expected expenditures. So when you start to talk about a decrease in general fund revenues, you're looking at a pretty big delta right there to start with. So, the question we've been asking ourselves is how much reserves do we want to maintain right now going into the fall, into the winter, when the students come back, when there might be a relapse of this effect and we could be living in the exact same days. So yeah, if this is a known quantity right now, we can absolutely burn through those reserves and you know get right back to business and start recovery, but this this scenario doesn't play that way. So, you know, how tight are we going to be with money now versus, you know, we're left with lot, not a whole lot of other choices this winter. So that's something that we've been balancing very hard in our discussions at the um, at uh, administrative level and with the department heads. So really, finally, it's time to start talking about uh, the economic outlook. And I, I want to point something out very intently is if you look at what I've put up there, you know, where our optimistic scenario is 2.8 million and our pessimistic scenario is to close is 6.3 million up to 20% uh, decrease in the general fund. I've, those are big numbers and I haven't extrapolated those out into the thousands or $10,000 yet because it is just too it, it's, it's changing so fast. I mean, when, when you start to see that 2.8 turn into 2.85, and I start to add numbers after that decimal point, that's a good sign. That means we're starting to get a handle on things here and we can really get down to some better predictions. So we were on a uh, webinar today with MRSC and they, gave us an update. We have another one tomorrow with MRSC with an economist. So I'll hear what they have to say and we'll keep forecasting and adjusting as we go. 
So what we can tell the council right now at uh, our level is we're going to continue to curtail and postpone expenditures. Everything that you know we can push off to later till we know where we sit before we have to make an outright cut is the best way to go. Things that we're absolutely cutting right now that you just there's no other way to do it like travel. There's nowhere to go. Um, anybody that does um, certifications, keeping those up online versus going somewhere overnight because people just aren't traveling anyway. So we've discussed the general fund with the volatility in past slides. Um, and I have also mentioned there's really been no direct here, city of Pullman, we know you have a revenue issue. Here's some money, spend it as you see fit. That That's, that's what I'm looking for. So if you know anybody at the state level or the federal level and you can advocate for some of that, that's those are the dollars we really need right now is to plug some of these holes due to lost revenues. Um, you know, shovel ready projects to do doesn't, you know, take care of paying our police officers today. So any questions on this one before I move on? Okay. So going forward, uh, the most important thing to remember, and it's not on this list, is um, we are still maintaining a uh, voucher system uh, with the audit committee. That's uh, Dan and Ann. So they're reviewing the finances as uh, we go through. I'm making deliveries to you know make sure we limit uh, contact and coming into City Hall. So they've been absolute rock stars for me and taking the work as it comes. So I appreciate that. Uh, them and they're really good questions when they're looking at the vouchers and asking me these um, about postponing and what is this. So it's it's been a very good working relationship. So I really appreciate uh, that. Uh, really, the biggest activity going forward is we just need some clarity from the state and the feds as well. But uh, yeah, I mean the last slide that I had with the forecast is now officially obsolete. So. We'll get more information tomorrow and I'll do some more forecasting. Um, we're gonna monitor the economic uh, events and eventually the forecast will be kind of right. So those days are coming. Uh, I just Preparations for recovery really, really start now. So those days are just coming. Um, I always put the third bullet in there because I think if you talk about it's bad and it's going to be bad and it's going to stay bad, then you're right. You know, so I, I it's, it's hard for the finance director to be uh, the optimist. It's I'm, you're, you're paying me to be uh, more of a realist and a little, little bit of a downer from time to time, but I believe in this community and I believe that uh, we can weather this and come back. So we're just going to stay vigilant with our monetary policy, health of the city, health of our staff, and so we can do our best to prevent that relapse and we can really move forward on those types of things. So I got one more slide. So are there any questions on this one? All right, this is my favorite slide, drives Adam crazy. So just please help our community. We're going to stay home and stay healthy. We're gonna wash our hands. We don't wanna relapse, so cover your cough. And most importantly for Jen, she'll she'll hurt me if I don't say it. Eat, you know, buy local, everybody. Let's support our neighbors and our friends and our families around here. So um, thank you very much, Council. And I'm gonna disconnect the share and answer any more questions that may have popped up here. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Questions of Mike on this. I think all of us have been in different kinds of webinars and state sessions. I've, I think I got four tomorrow and I've had a number, but the ones I've been with with the state, they're talking about a shortfall of five to $10 billion for the state. And they're talking like 10 to 15% hit on their, uh, their revenue from the state standpoint. At least that's what I heard this past week. I don't know if you've heard other kinds of things like that. Some of you may have heard from the university standpoint, but uh, anyone wants to augment that or? Any additional comments or questions? Glenn. Um, Nathan. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, Mike, I just gotta say, thank you for keeping us in the loop, keeping us, uh, you know, in reality, because uh, I think right now we're all trying to stay really, really positive. 
Um, but it's also important to balance that with, with what, is, what is the reality, what is the pessimistic, but also optimistic viewpoint. So um, you're keeping us honest and, and I really appreciate it. It helps all of us and I'm sure all of our departments uh, uh, plan better. So thank you so much for that. Thank Adam, you. did I see your hand up? No, sir. Oh, okay, okay. Any others? Yes, Pat. Uh, unmute. Yep. There we go. So two things. First, thank you, Jen, for everything that you've done because that's a thankless job that you have. And I know both you and Mike, this really isn't what you guys signed up for when you came to us so recently. So I appreciate everything you guys are doing. But I'm, I'm just wondering if there's any thought with um, kind of a sliding scale of who's working and who's not working. And one, as far as the city is concerned, and one of the thoughts that I have is, you know, we have so many donations and so much invested in our parks and our park people are not working for a variety of reasons, but could this not be a time where we might be able to capitalize on getting out there and doing some, some work with pe other people not being allowed in that area? I know that may be a very, um, simplistic view of things, but it's a thought that I have as far as what we're doing as a city to kind of look at some of the opportunities that we might have with those kinds of situations. So, yeah, if I could answer that. So um, we did have a couple of weeks where our parks employees weren't um, weren't all working on projects, but they've, they've actually been out now that the weather's nicer, they, they're back working in the parks and and taking care of that that maintenance that we don't want to let it um, go go too far without being able to keep things keep things going. Um, and I'm I'm sorry I didn't catch the the first part of your question about a, a sliding scale. Well, I mean where we've got park employees furloughed. Gotcha. So any anybody who uh, has has been um, working for a department that hasn't necessarily had a, a, a a lot of work and they've, they've been home or using some of the COVID leave as as we find projects we certainly offer those um, to those employees first uh, for example we've got uh, normally we hire a bunch of seasonal employees to to help out for both parks and public works maintenance and operations so um, those types of hirings didn't happen and we'll be offering that kind of work first to anybody who's currently not working who's normally on our payroll okay Thank you. Just want to make sure that we kind of were, I, some of those things, you know, at the top level seem frivolous, but at the same time, we have so much invested in some of those things that it would be a tragedy to let them go if we had the resources to be able to throw at some of those while reallocating some of those resources. So that was the basis for my question. Thank you, Adam. Sure, and then just to pile on a little bit, it, one of the discussions we did have with our department heads and is the, the maintaining of assets. Sure, we may not be able to do this big project we were hoping to do, but you know, keep the asset maintained and operating because we're gonna have to probably use it longer um, under the current circumstances. And kudos should go out to Kirk Gaiman and his recreation staff because they could have used professional movers to get things done to move to the new rec building and many of the uh, employees, because some of them were furloughed, all came back and helped move a lot of the stuff to the, the new rec building at the new city hall. So I w went through there today. They still have to be inspected. We hope tomorrow morning so they can have occupancy. I see Kevin giving me a nod. That's good to hear. Uh, but we've got them with IT, so we've got some other things going on. So uh, I really got to hand it to the, the Kirk and the, and the crew for working through that. I know, Kirk, if you want to make some additions, uh, comments, but I was looking at some of your crew today and they said, oh, I needed to get some rest after that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Glenn. No, uh, I guess two weeks ago, we moved uh, the Pioneer Center over and we've probably got about 90% of that put away, still a few things to do. And then 
a week ago. Today, we moved the senior center out of City Hall um, and kind of got about half of that put away. We're kind of waiting on the final inspection. And then the, the kitchen still has to get a, um, inspected by the county health department. So that's kind of the next step. And once that gets approved, then we can kind of put that piece together and then kind of just waiting on next steps. But yeah, we had a great help from our parks crew and all the parks rec employees stepping up and, uh, you know, making that move on our own and kind of saving uh, some city dollars and Mike can shake his head right now. Um, but yeah, we had no great help all the way around and uh, just appreciated everybody's support on that. Okay, Nathan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just had a real quick clarification. Uh, I needed to ask about parks. Over here at McGee, there's some yellow tape that is missing and some people have been playing on it. Uh, some uh, families, some college kids. Are the playgrounds now open? I, I wasn't sure. No, the playgrounds are not open at this time we'll uh we'll send some folks over to over there to take care of it thank you for letting us know okay thanks for the clarification and if other council members see tape missing please let us know eileen uh unmute eileen eileen and nina unmute sorry about that i had my mouse working on the wrong computer um, I'd like to clarify that the playgrounds and the parks are open. It's the playground equipment that is still off limits, right? Correct. Because yeah. we have, we've actually, and Gary mentioned this, I think one time that we actually had some complaints from people playing uh, that said, oh, they're out there playing Frisbee golf. Well, Frisbee golf was socially distant and they certainly had no issues whatsoever. So they cannot be out there and play. And uh, it's just the playground equipment because you've, you're trying to sanitize it, and it's very difficult to do that. Thank other you for that comments? clarification. Any other comments for that? Okay. With that, we now go to our consent agenda. These are items that are considered routine in nature. Do I hear a motion to read by title only? So moved. Second. Moved and second. Uh, and D, I'm going to make sure that you got who did the motion the second. Did you get it? Is you do you have that on board, Doc? So I just want to make sure you got. It it you, was Nathan that moved and Dan that second. Good. Okay. I just want to make sure you correct? got it. All I'm right. in a lot of these meetings which Thank you. they don't have board docs, and I just want to make sure you heard. Okay. All those in Thank favor. Thank you. I appreciate it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. With that, Laura McAloon, our city attorney. With a full Mayor, list. Your consent agenda consists of a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the regular meeting of March 10, 2020 and approve them as submitted. A motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the regular meeting of March 17, 2020 and approve them as submitted. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under a declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020 of the following disbursements. Sorry, that needs opened. Accounts payable check number 2252020 totaling $80,312.68 accounts payable checks number 99272 through 99376 totaling $1,250,286.80 payroll checks numbered 6086087 through 60448 totaling $532,944.20 Accounts payable checks numbered 99400 through 99472, totaling $944,826.83. Accounts payable checks numbered 99473 through 99567, totaling $419,505.26. Accounts payable check number 352020, totaling $81,667.06. Payroll checks numbered 60449 through 60820, totaling 545, $545,398.14. Accounts payable checks numbered 99615 through 99670, totaling 
Accounts payable check numbered 4092020, totaling $30,315.17. Accounts payable checks numbered 99671 through 99731, totaling $1,466,437.92. Payroll checks numbered 60821 through 61138, totaling $548,026.03. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under a declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020, for a letter of direction modification for Paradise Hills subdivision number eight. Oh, excuse me. No, I, I'm sorry, I thought I skipped item four. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under a declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020 to transfer $208,348 of retail sales tax revenue to the restricted CIP reserve fund for 2020 quarter one. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under a declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020 of change order number three to the city hall and parks and recreation center relocation contract a motion to ratify the administrative approval under declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020 to accept the Pullman Wastewater Treatment Plant Headworks Perforated Plats Screen Project 18-11 as complete. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020 of resolution number R-19-20, a resolution authorizing the execution of a First Amendment to agreement relating to proration of capital and operating costs of the Pullman wastewater treatment plant between the city of Pullman and Washington State University and an institution of higher education and agency of the state of Washington to extend the term through June 30, 2020. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020, resolution number R-20-20, a resolution authorizing the execution of a water quality combined financial assistance agreement between the city of Pullman and the Washington State Department of Ecology for the Pullman Stormwater Decamp Facility Project. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020, resolution number R-21-20, a resolution approving the final plot of Sunnyside Heights subdivision number 11 and authorizing the mayor and finance and administrative services director to sign the final plat. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020, resolution number R-22-20, a resolution accepting the bid of Knox Concrete LLC for Sidewalks 2020 and authorizing execution and delivery of the contract for said project. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020, resolution number R-23-20, a resolution approving a change in financial reporting for the city of Pullman, instructing the director of finance and accounting to begin reporting on a cash basis to the Washington state auditor immediately and other matters related thereto. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020, Resolution number R-24-20, a resolution authorizing the mayor and the finance and administrative services director to execute a local agency agreement supplement number one and updated project prospectus for the arterial streets resurfacing 2020 project. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020. Resolution number R-25-20, a resolution accepting the bid of SNL Underground Incorporated for airport utility extension, sanitary sewer, and authorizing execution and delivery of the contract for said project. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020, resolution number R-26-20, a resolution authorizing the execution of an engineering services agreement between the City of Pullman and RH2 Engineering Incorporated for the purpose of providing a City of Pullman water system plan update. A motion to ratify the administrative approval under a declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020, resolution number R-27-20, a resolution authorizing the execution of a mutual assistance compact between the City of Pullman, Washington and the City of Moscow, Idaho for the provision of public work services, and a motion to ratify the administrative approval under declaration of emergency dated March 12, 2020, resolution number R-28-20, a resolution pre-authorizing the acceptance of grant monies under the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act to provide economic assistance in response to COVID-19 operational impacts. 
Is there any uh, measure the council would like out for uh, discussion? I, Brandon's or notified us that 12 and 13 are still out for you, Brandon? Yes, 12 and 13 are out. Okay. Anyone else would like to have something for further discussion? 11. I just have to give a clap to Laura. That was awesome. <laughs> was like a awesome. filibuster. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. She is a, you know, she is a professional attorney. They, they, you know, they, they can do this. You know. All right. Any other, any other one else? Okay. Yeah. yeah. No? Eleven. Eleven. Okay. With that, our consent agenda consists of items one through ten, fourteen through eighteen. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? With that, we'll start with number 11, Al. So I just, I have some questions on this, uh, Kevin, uh, in regards to the uh, timeline on these sidewalks up in there. And, uh, Am I mistaken that we don't have sidewalks needing to be put in sooner than three years? That's correct. This this uh, subdivision went through the preliminary plat phase before the, that changed in our design standards. So in our conversations with Laura, um, that development was vested under the old standards. So they have three years to put in all the sidewalks from the date of the final plat. They have, uh, they have constructed sidewalk along Fairview, or I mean along Center Street. So those sidewalks are in up front. It's just the court that doesn't happen until the houses get constructed. Right. right. So has there been any uh, request of the developers to do that, or is this something that they want then to wait three years? Uh, yeah, it's their preference to do these as they build the houses. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, you know where I sit on this. Uh, I I'm just wanted to make sure that uh, this was something that was done previously because uh, I think that those sidewalks need to be in, uh, particularly with this one being right next door to a uh, assisted living facility and retirement center where uh, we have uh, more mature citizens out walking the neighborhood. Uh, and then walking in the street versus walking on sidewalks is a, a preference for me, plus a safety issue. Any other comments on uh, number 11? Yeah, real quick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to mention, I completely support what Al Sorenstein is saying as a past caregiver, um, you know, elderly people can, I, I you know, wander off and especially if there's no son sidewalks there get really hurt so, so i support al Sorensen in the comment so and you heard you heard kevin's comment consulting with laura they're still under that window okay i understand yeah eileen yeah real quick uh kevin and laura how many more are out there sort of in this window that will have to be uh you know waiting these longer periods on for sidewalks um, it would be any preliminary plat that was um, approved prior to the, the design standards changing. Um, so there could be uh, maybe one more with the Atanis um, in the same area. Um, it just depends. There's also a time limit on, um, they have so many years from preliminary plat approval to submit the final plat. So depending on whether they keep going on some of the land that was originally preliminary platted, it could still be final platted. There's some the Atanis could do. And then um, Steve Mater has some around Kamiak Elementary School that would fall under that window as well. Okay, we'll be keeping an eye on them. Sure. Any other comments? If not, do I hear a motion item, item number 11, a resolution approving the final plat of Sunnyside Heights subdivision? Move to adopt. Second. second. Move and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Yeah. 
Any opposed? Nay. One nay from Al. Okay, we are going now to item number 12. Brandon, this is the resolution for Knox Concrete. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mayor. Um, I, I've i looked at the map here uh, that was available, um, and I just had a question. I don't know if this is um, one that Kevin can answer. Uh, knowing all of these streets, uh, some of them are definitely in need of uh, some sidewalk. Um, <laughs> work. Uh, my question is really this last block of High Street, um, knowing it looks like the crossroad is, um, oh shoot, is that Derby? So the last couple of High Street, uh, where I know that there are currently, I don't think there are our sidewalks on that last one. Uh, so, so I was curious, um, the reasoning behind that, why that was chosen, um, if the residents there um, are aware um, of sidewalks, uh, you know, being put in infill or, or what have you. Uh, yeah, the reason that's part of uh, the sidewalk um, contract has both repair work and it has infill work in it. So um, this is the main part of the infill for uh, 2020, and with no um, no sidewalk on either side, uh, there really isn't a good connection to the new city hall and parks and rec location on Crestview from this area without walking in the streets. So when we originally looked at scoping the improvements around the new city hall and parks and rec building, we looked at improving the sidewalk along Crestview that fronts um, that property and we completed that uh, last year. Um, We've looked at putting a park and bike path on the other side of Crestview to improve bike ped connections. And then this was the third piece that seemed to make sense as far as providing a pedestrian connection from the Pioneer uh, Hill neighborhood to the through the north side of the city hall property. Um, OK, and, and and, you know, there are on there are certain houses on that right now that have sidewalks and then others that don't but on the one side uh, so i guess that would be the the east side um, of that street i know that there are there are some that uh, it looks like an engineering uh, almost impossibility based on some retaining walls so is is the expectation that they'll only go on the one side on the west side up against uh, the church and where the thompsons live and like that that side of the street or are we going to try and do both sides um, my expectation was we we'd probably just do the one side unless there was a big push from the residents on the other side to do that. Um, for the same reasons you just mentioned, it's much more challenging to try to put it on the other side, the, the east side. The west side is what we chose because that's a lot easier. Do, do these residents know that um, this is in our plans at this point? Um, I don't know that we've talked to all the residents up there, but we've talked to some of them because they're at least one resident has a huge uh, mature tree that uh, needs needs to be removed to put the sidewalk in. So we have done some outreach up there. I just can't tell you whether we've talked to everybody or not. Okay, and, and this is for pedestrian purposes. Um, so there's there's nothing, no, no other motive. I mean, there's nothing in the works to uh, you know try to open that up or or anything like that at at, at this point in terms of the street. Uh, no, this we're not leading to something else. We're not planning to um, open that up right now. It's available for emergency vehicles. There's a, mm -hmm. a, a new fence that was put in a gate that's up there now. So it's got a, a Knox box on it. So both police and fire can access through there. And there's a on the west side, there's an opening for pedestrians or for bicyclists to be able to go through there. And um, in a subsequent project, either next year or the year after, we'll look at constructing some sidewalk on the city uh, hall, parks and rec site itself to get to the buildings. So this is okay. just getting to the property right now. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. that's, point, that's, uh, that's it, Mayor. Another question? Yeah. Al? Well, Brandon, I just wanted you to know that uh, when we uh, years ago went around and, and checked out all the gaps and sidewalks and things in town, this was definitely on the end of uh, being a fairly large project. And, and so it would not probably be getting done right, Kevin, if, if this wasn't for access basically to City Hall, this, this wouldn't be happening. But this was a uh, fairly expensive, big project 
just so you know. We've, we've evaluated uh, most of these. Right, Kevin? That's correct. Yeah. Any other comments? If not, do I hear a motion on item 12, the resolution accepting the bid for Knox Concrete? Yeah, move to adopt uh, number 12. Second. Second from Pat. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Okay, with that, we go to item number 13. Brandon, this is the one on the cash basis. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate this. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with um, with this one, I, I, and I, I think the reason I wanted to pull it out was I, my understanding is it will certainly simplify uh, reporting on a short term basis, um, and obviously in theory it, it would be easier to be single entry accountant. Um, I but I do know that in spite of the tremendous benefits, as I've read a little bit, uh, heard from some some various residents. You know there is some concern as well, um, and when Mike Urban had brought this up, he had asked if we wanted to uh, receive a presentation on this, and I, we all agreed that 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 would be a good idea to do that. Um, so you know, regardless of this being, uh, I guess, tentatively approved or approved administratively with expectation to ratify. Um, I would like to, before approving any of this, I'd like to receive that presentation, whether it's the next council meeting and then maybe have a, a um, time until the following council meeting to, to look over, to consider that presentation, uh, just because of all the issues that, that I've heard, whether, whether it undoes, does accruals, whether uh, you know, it enables us to reflect real current earnings, um, if it's simply a cash in, cash out um, advantage. And I, I know these are things that Mike will be able to answer for us, but, um, but I, I think it would be um, wise of us to, um, to be able to hear that presentation that Mike had asked us um, if we wanted to hear and, and we had said yes. Mike, uh, go to you. I know you have a presentation in, your, in the file. Uh, so Mike, uh, floor is yours. It's queued up, it's ready to go. So um, as a matter of fact, I was planning on bringing back the exact same presentation, but tailored to the Metro Parks because we're gonna ask the Metro Parks Board to do the same um, adjustment too. So I'd be happy to make the presentation tonight. Um, answer all the questions from council and then uh, do the presentation again next week for Metro Parks, I'll be at probably a little abbreviated since you've already had it um, once, or if it's the council's pleasure, I can do the entire presentation next week. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mike. And I, I won't speak for the rest of council. It would be my pleasure to be able to hear that tonight. That's fine if you're ready for that, but um, I would prefer to have some time to think about your presentation and not vote on that tonight. The presentation has been in the file, so Pat, I, I guess my biggest question is if there is an egg, an existency for getting that approved tonight. And I would defer that to Mike. Okay. Um, there is because the one of the things that hasn't changed at the state level is the state audit is still due the 29th of May. So if we do not switch to um, cash basis, we will continue making adjusting entries um, according to GAAP. Um, I'm pretty positive we will not meet that uh, 29th deadline anyway. We're still struggling with some past audit issues. Um, if we switch to cash basis, I think there is a 20% chance we can make the 29th of May, but we're also hearing from the um, state auditor that uh, See, the, the, the due date is controlled by RCW. It's not at the whim of the state auditor. So she has to work through the legislative channels to get that changed. And they've been ver working very hard to extend that through the end of June. With a cash basis audit, we could, I believe we can absolutely be done by the end of June. With a accrual basis, no, but we'll, we'll turn it in when it's done and it's correct. Um, there's, uh, now I'll get into the rest of that for the presentation, but that's that's the time discussion on this. Nathan, I, did I see your hand earlier or not? Okay. Al. Okay. So uh, Mike, it's my understanding that the state auditor's office is 
highly suggesting that uh, we move to the cash basis. Is that correct? Am I off on that? No, you are correct. It was suggested to us uh, last year when I arrived. I wasn't ready to change accounting methods after being here for 10 minutes. Um, as I worked through the uh, work of my predecessor, I found some things that needed to be looked at a little more deeply um, under the circumstances. Through the process, we saw how much time and um, the expenses that went into this, not just internally and staff time, but our cost to the state auditor were well over $80,000 on the 2018 audit. And when we sat down with the uh, state auditor, uh, when they were in town before all this happened, we asked them what it change to cash basis would look like as far as cost savings go. And they use the word astronomical. That's a direct quote. Yeah. So we're looking well, at efficiencies, trying to save money, trying to do all the things we want every other department to do. I, I have a hard time not bringing this to council, especially now that the COVID thing has happened and we're looking at places where we can save dollars. Yeah, um, that's a great idea. Uh, I think it's a, uh, a money saving thing and we're going to have to be tightening our belt quite a bit and it's uh, my understanding also that the the length of the report is going to be about cut in half or even maybe more than that is that yeah so adam did you oh did you have a comment before i go to ann no i i think it's it's worthwhile to have have mike run through the slide deck uh, i i, I I think any traditional accounting, you know, it's hard to say that you're going to move away from accrual to cash just from, I don't know, you take a few accounting classes and that's where they they teach you to go. However, I, I think that Mike's put a lot of thought in this. I think his presentation will will highlight the, the items that are important to highlight um, and just say that it seems like um, a lot of the offices that we rely on and the uh, national level professional organization that Mike's a part of are also indicating that uh, cash is becoming the the methodology that's being pushed on on cities or the preferred method that cities are um, going to be following as as these trends for not training in in gap as much and, and things like that. But that's all in his presentation, so I'd say it's a good time to run through it. And and then uh, I I personally would like to see the presentation tonight, so we can especially with the deadline he's on. So Anne. I agree. I just want to ask because it sounds like Brandon was alluding to transparency concerns among constituents and others. So I wanted to, um, Mike, ask you to address that and does it affect transparency at all or ability for the public or anyone to see? Does it change that at all? No, I mean, to the public who uses these um, audited financials, which is mostly the bondholders and um, uh, the different agencies that rely on us to report for federal grants, it's completely transparent as well as with uh, just the general public. When you get into gap accounting and you look at mm. the types of reports it'll do, if, if you're a well-trained accountant, you can get through them pretty well. If you're a medium trained accountant, you can get through them. If you're the general public and I'm going to pick on my wife because I love her and she'll forgive me. She'll struggle and ask some questions. Um, and that's, I'm an accountant, I'll help her through it. The trend, level of transparency remains the same. When 80% of our state is reporting on cash basis, I, I'm not worried about a level of transparency at all. Thank you. Well, and, and if you don't mind me, so um, I appreciate that, Ann, but I was not worried about transparency for residents. Um, I had mentioned that a few residents had talked to me about um, this system and some concerns that they had, but it wasn't a, an issue of transparency. Uh, it was more of an issue of the principle of, of had, we, uh, had we heard uh, Mike's presentation in the first place, were we going to be expected to approve that change that night um, anyway? So, so in this case, being able to, to receive this information, that doesn't mean I'm necessarily go going to understand it, um, and Mike certainly does, and um, he does a great job explaining that. Um, but to to try to reconcile the concerns that I've heard, um, maybe that maybe they will be taken care of through the questions that I'll ask Mike after his presentation. Maybe not. I, I'm not sure. But um, if it is a situation where uh, it still doesn't make sense to me, then you know I, I feel like I'd be remiss to just say yes, let's move forward, right? Even if I'm in the minority on that. Um, 
So that's uh, that's really what the issue was about: is making sure that we can um, uh, touch upon those those concerns. So, Mike, and, since your PowerPoint's yeah. there, uh, yeah. why don't you why don't you start that report? Yeah, and now would be good. Okay, yeah. working on sharing. And so, yep, as you can see, I, I did get uh, a heads up from Brandon that this would be happening. So I was able to pull the PowerPoint. And as you can see, it was originally dated March 24th. Um, before I dig into my deal, I just want to correct uh, one little thing in case somebody else is out there listening and heard this. The city of Pullman is doing no single entry accounting. We do not believe in single entry accounting. Um, single entry accounting is just a big fat no-no in our world. So it's all going to be double entry, um, debits and credits, everything needs to balance. So um, I know that came up as a, a topic here. So I just wanted to uh, address that really quick before I jumped into it. So this presentation tonight is really an abbreviation of the memo that I sent to council on the third, which is also included in your packet. It's got the depth and breadth that you really want to look at where some of the things in here is for um, as an addendum to those items. If you can see on March 24th, I was planning to give this because on the 10th when we met, I alluded to this quite a bit during my presentation on the finances and this is a direction we'd be going. In between the 10th and the 24th, everything changed. So this has just been sitting on the sidelines waiting. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really excited to present this to you. Uh, we spent a lot of time in my department researching this, really trying to identify the pros and the cons and um, putting those out there too, where this isn't the perfect end all be all, but we think it's a better way to go than what we've been doing. So that's why we're recommending it. So as with my other um, slide deck, I'm just gonna um, stop at the end of each slide before I switch and make sure I answer all the questions. And uh, if you can announce, then you'll jump up onto my screen and I'll continue going. So before I move on, are there any uh, questions? Okay, let's get into Fun with Accounting by Mike. Okay, so what led up to this recommendation? There was the whole com you know, compiling and producing of the 2018 state audit, uh, changes in GASB rules where there was notes that uh, we had to learn on the fly that were required in 2018 that weren't required in pre previous years. So it wasn't a matter of you know just plugging and playing. There was wholesale changes in there. So it drugged the process on a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, the 2019 audit due date is May 29th. It's 150 days after the beginning of the year because it was a leap year, it moved up a day. So that's something that the state auditor's office has been reminding us because it's always the 30th, always the 30th. And this year it's a little bit different. Under the COVID, as I mentioned, they are working very hard to, uh, to legislatively change it. They thought they could do it administratively through the governor's office and that, that didn't fly with the attorneys. So we're still in the holding pattern. We feel very confident that uh, we'll get the extra 30 days, but if not, we'll just keep producing and turn in. I know the state auditor's office is um, working remotely a lot like our office. So them being able to do some audits. I know there was a couple school audits that are just put on hold um, because they can't be on site to um, review. So there, there's some issues with timing as well. So uh, delay in this makes a lot of sense all the way around. Um, the biggest thing where I finally threw up my hands and said enough is enough, we need to start researching this is one of the activities that we perform as a city is the uh, accounting arm of the Pullman Moscow Airport. And they will continue reporting on GAAP basis because they have uh, grant funds through the FAA that require it um, based on the way that the grants were signed. Because of that, the local auditor has asked us to start reporting certain things coming through the airport as cash. We'd already been reporting on GAAP and then we've been reporting some things that they've recommended kind of in a hybrid method. That's a 20 minute conversation for later. I'm just, I hope you take me at my word on that. So um, now they want us to do three different reportings as part of the city of Pullman and one of them is cash. So why not switch everything 
to cash and avoid all the extra work and trying to remember this is cash and the reconciling of that. So that's what really got us started on this. A uh, couple of sides when uh, we brought in our uh, newest accountant here in February, I wanted to send him to a gap training class. There were none available on the east side of the state. In fact, there were only two scheduled in the entire state at the time, but there were nine or 10 different cash ones because even the state auditor's office is pushing us towards working with the GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, to get training from them on gap and accrual basis because they're doing less and less of it on their own. In fact, when the state auditors were in doing some work the other day, they asked us for our blue book, which is the GASB book, so they can look some things up themselves. Um, and then really what it comes down to as a department head for me is I, I need to look at the workload of my staff. What information, what items do we need to push out? What workflow do we need to handle to continue operating as a department? Where can we find efficiencies? Where can we find cost savings? The exact same things that I'm asking out of all my other departments as well, um, especially right now under this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. So uh, it made a lot of sense. We spent a lot of time talking about transparency and the pros and the cons. I have a few slides on that too. But this is what got us to this point is um, really it was the three forms of reporting, which one was cash. It was the amount of work that needs to be produced to put this out, and I have that on another slide as well, where I can touch on Al's uh, point a little bit more. So really is what, what things should we be doing in this department with freeing up our time to um, from gap reporting where I'm having staff work long hours and this and me and all of that. Can we be better use that time towards forecasting, towards budgeting, towards other internal things for the city of Pullman and its, and its citizens and community. So before I move on, are there any questions on this? Okie dokie, here we go. So the current reporting method, our gap framework, um, you know, if we were face to face right now, I'd be holding up the uh, GASB book. It's about yay thick on, you know, all the different rules just for gap reporting, all the different reports, all the different notes. And then each year they put out an addendum that's about, you know, about the size of three magazines and here's the changes and here's what you need to do. Um, now general gap accounting is generally accepted accounting principles. This is pure accounting. This is what I like, you know, accruals and, you know, debits and, or not debits and credits, but uh, payables, receivables. Um, this is pure accounting. This is what I grew up doing and this is what I love. And to go away from what I love because it makes more sense is, you know, something I'm more than willing to um, forego. So typically expenses are recognized when they occur, when goods or services are received, whether we paid for them or not, it, it's recognized, it has happened. Revenue, typically recognized when it's earned or measurable. So this is kind of what holds us up a little bit when we're doing our reporting is we're two months behind on sales tax, as I mentioned. So we cannot start reporting and doing the work until we know what sales tax is coming in in February because it is recognized as December revenue. So now you've taken that 150 day window and you've shrunk it to 90 days because it's not a plug and play issue where we could do everything but this and then keep going because the revenue affects this report, affects that report, affects that report. So we're, we're waiting to get started. We're in cash. I'll get to that a little bit more. It's cash in, cash out. So the extensive year-end adjusting entries, that's what really bogs us down with those. Um, yep, I mentioned that note. So that's what we're doing currently, um, along with 20% of the rest of the state, the, the Seattle's, the Spokane's, the King counties, the state agencies. Um, so questions on that before I move on to the next one? Yeah, yeah, Mike, and, and feel free to, um, to tell me, I appreciate this slide, feel free to tell me that, that uh, you're ready to answer my question uh, after another slide or if the answer is coming. Um, so, so in terms of the accruals that you mentioned, um, so would this, um, 
Would this create a situation that would uh, require us to undo uh, accruals or cause an increase or decrease to net earnings for the year? Because um, I assume it will depend on you know balance of assets and liabilities and things like that. They're already accrued. So is is that going to change? Will I think I mentioned earlier a real uh, reflection of the current earnings? Um, is that going to change pretty drastically? A little bit. Um, drastic is a tough thing for me to wrap my mind around since I've been yeah, talking about twenty five million dollars for the last couple of weeks with the expenses of closing that. Um, no, we're talking about tens and maybe hundreds of thousands, and depending on the timing of when airport dollars come in, um, you know, when when should we have really realized this uh, or recognized this? Uh, airport grant, you know, we got the, this happened. We, we got the money January 17th and they say, oh, no, 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 you need to go put that into December. So, well, you know, how did we know that at that particular point? It was dated the 17th and this, it, it was a receivable and a payable and that's the way it should have been, but uh, the state auditor decided otherwise. So if we, it, it totally makes sense that if we're not recognizing revenue, you know, when it's received or expenses when when they occur, um, how are we able to tell how, how well we're performing in each, like each period, I guess? In more in real time, cash in, cash out, a lot like what you do at home and what I do. And when I get um, my paycheck, I know I can pay the bills out of that, but you know, I can assume that more money is coming um, the next month, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not writing check. I'm not writing checks against those future dollars until I've wrecking or realized them. They've actually hit my account because if there's a hiccup, then I'm cutting bad checks. So when I present to you during uh, council meetings and give you the reports as to where we are on expenses and um, all those items, I'm reporting to you on cash basis because to stop our work and go and do all the accruals for a presentation would take us anywhere from 15 to 20 hours. And then we would have to reverse them all back out so we can keep going for the rest of the year. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So we'll move on to the next slide. So, you know, the advantages and there are disadvantages that, I, again, I, I get into a lot more detail in the memo, so I'm going to point you that way, but the advantages to GAP, it's consistent with uh, nationally recognized organizations. Um, it's, you know, they, they, GASB spends a lot of time creating and writing rules and uh, producing and changing and um, bringing up new stuff. So it's, these are professionals that really dig into the depths of accounting. And when I like to geek out, I like to read what they're writing about. Um, in certain situations, uh, GAP may be required by grantors and oversight agencies. Before we made this recommendation, we did check with our granting agencies. We did, you know, Umpqua Bank. We checked with all of our, um, for the loans, we checked with all of our grants. The only ones that are requiring us to report on GAP right now is the FAA. Everybody else, even FEMA, um, says, what are you, cash or gap? They just want to know they aren't going to require a certain type of reporting. And a lot of these grants, when they do come out later, have that opportunity. They're not going to look at us and say, oh, you're not gap, or well, we're not going to loan to you, because then that means they're only loaning to 20% of the entire state. But we know other counties and other districts are getting dollars as well. So the... Financial reports are more robust and sophisticated um, and more informative to those uh, users that are familiar with it. Conversely, those people that aren't familiar with it, it's, it's quite long and uh, trying to find some of the information is tough and there's some different terminology in there that uh, will send some folks having to go back to the dictionary from time to time. But um, for accountants, it's fairly easy to roll through. Um, the training associated with uh, any changes to GASB uh, is going to be a lot more. Uh, it requires staff to um, spend a lot of time on that. And uh, I just did an OPEB um, ongoing uh, post employment benefits uh, for the 2018 deal. It was uh, just 12 pages of that this weekend. 
So at the time I wrote this, I said OPEB isn't part of, uh, you know, gap or isn't part of cash, but in 2019 it is. Unfortunately, I've done it before, but if you can extrapolate that out to other notes, it's just a lot of extra um, production work there. Okay, any questions on this before I move on? Okay, so what we're asking to or recommending that we're going to is the cash basis uh, or as other comprehensive basis. So there's really gap and non-gap cash basis is accepted by the state auditor as another comprehensive basis. And it's pretty simple. Expenses are recognized, realized when they're paid. Revenues are realized when we get the dollars cash in, cash out. As Soon as we're done with the um, uh, January period where POs are coming in um, that might have some prior year items, I believe that was G uh, January 17th this year, we can start working on this right away. Questions on that? Okay. So again, disadvantages and advantages, and we want to present these in a fair light. So it's a clear presentation of cash flows. What is available now? When we're looking at our uh, budget and what we're looking at for cuts is what is available now? We, we, we can still track receivables and we're going to, because we want to know what we're going to expect from the county and if we're short. So a lot of these things that you know aren't presented in the final report to the state auditor will still be tracked internally. And I, I touch on that in the memo. It's just what does the state auditor require from us so they can check the box and move on to the next jurisdiction. So because of this, financial reporting is more aligned with the actual budget activities. It's what's going on at this particular time. Um, of course, it's the efficiency part of it. And the big thing is the cost. Um, the disadvantages, as Brandon, you alluded to, it, it is really focused on the short term. We will still be tracking long-term items, like what's our long-term debt? What's our, what do we need to do for capital items? So those things aren't going to be lost because we switched to this. They're just not going to be presented to the state auditor for opinion. So we're, we're going to continue doing our day-to-day -day operations and not producing the, the volume of reports that they require. Mike, are there any um, downsides for things like uncollected accounts? Um, you know, I, I just, I'm not sure if, um, if that would play into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there is. And um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that actually, because that was something I was going to touch on in my other presentation is um, we might have a fair amount of uncollected accounts uh, for our utilities with uh, the way things are looking right now. But again, I said that was the, one of the trailing indicators. So since we're only realizing cash when we actually um, receive it, then there will be when accounts are quote unquote written off, then there's an accounting change for that because we have a receivable, we have to um, write that off. With this, we just, we never received the dollars. So it doesn't change the revenues picture for you. It just means that we didn't get paid. Okay. So the, the other disadvantages are just there's less information for non-cash assets like uh, uh, equipment, but we're going to continue tracking those anyway because um, we think that's important and uh, necessary. It's just what are we tracking and doing internally versus what are we reporting to the state auditor under these two methods. And as I touched on earlier, there'll be less information in the, uh, in the report on um, liabilities, but that's something we can bring up a couple of keystrokes out of Eden. Okay. So any questions on this one? Yeah, I just have one, one, uh, just the less information made me think of, uh, you know, comparative, comparative analysis. And I know um, you are, you and Adam both are, are really big into analysis and um, would, would this create a hole in the statements or, because it says statements focus primarily on short term, but what about, um, you know, for years where comparability, you know, where we, where we, where we'd want to look back, uh, you know, would this blow that up for, I don't know, lack of a better way to, to describe that? Nope. The, our, da our daily activities will remain exactly the same. It's just what report are we producing to the state auditor to get a clean audit from them? 
So we'll be able to go back and look at all these things all the way back because that's something that I think is important to manage as well. It's what, what do we need to produce for the auditor and what are all the additional items that come along with that. So, I mean, it's worth jumping ahead here to one of my other points because Al brought this up earlier. When you look at Puyallup, Shelton, and Port Orchard and Ellensburg, the last four cities that switched over from this, when you talk about volume of work to produce the state audit, the first number I'm going to give you on all of these is the last year they were on GAP and the first year, next number is the first year they're on cash. Puyallup went from 103 pages to 42. Shelton 95 to 31, Port Orchard 91 to 34, Ellensburg 98 to 36. So the numbers are still out there in various degrees and forms. It's all the associated notes, management discussion of analysis, all the things that go along with that. I'm, I'm hearing some additional background noise, so make sure everyone's muted uh, during this discussion if we can. Mike? Thank you. Uh, next slide. Okay, so comparing and contrasting, and really, again, the memo is the best place to look at this. Schedule one's required on both, but the state auditor uses schedule one for cash basis people to create the balance sheet for them where we're not having to do it separately, but still having to produce the schedule one and it's basically for not. Um, the additional financial statements I just mentioned and um, we have talked about the um, payables and these other items, how we're gonna to continue to maintain those internally for look back periods and see where we are. And we certainly have to with the bond, we wanna know when the bond payments are due um, and how much more we have left to pay on it. Any questions on this page before I move on? Okay. So the benefits of the change, I gotta catch up with my actual notes here. Yeah, so really providing the users with the financial statements necessary to make the information, you know, use that information. Um, much like 80% of the rest of the state, there's going to be useful information to their creditors, to their grant holders, and to their constituency. We're going to continue doing the same. Um, transparency, what's required for cash basis reporting to the state auditor is the same across the board. They have a bars manual for that as well. Um, staff time uh, could be reallocated to other things like forecasting, budget management, policy updates, um, maybe I can get back down to 60 hours a week. That'd be fun. Um, one of the things it does say in here, and we did talk to the state auditors, is it does reduce the risk of an adverse audit determination because with the less volume and tying and ticking and doing these things and missing a statement or missing a box, it, it, there is, it does reduce that risk and it does speed up their time, which goes into the next bullet point. When I talked to another city that um, made this switch, they said they saved huge. And as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, the state auditors themselves said astronomical, the amount of dollars that we can save. And um, again, it's efficiencies in being able to save money while still being completely transparent. Daily operations remain unchanged to our staff. They just keep putting stuff in and we keep paying the bills. Quarterly reporting to council remains unchanged. Year-end reporting speeds up because I don't have to do all the accruals to present that to you and then have to unwind all those accruals at the beginning of the next year. So we can bring the year-end reports to you much quicker as well. Questions on this? Okay, we're getting there folks, hang in there with me. So really, we, we need to ask ourselves these questions, and these are important, you know, how will you be able to assess the long term issues that won't be evident included in your financial statements? Well, we're going to maintain those items, as I've explained, and I think some of the long term issues that we could really um, do some good with is our CIP plan. We spend so much time focusing on the imminent year, we're not looking six years out, and that's supposed to be a six year plan. So here's an opportunity as well to do some more long term items and there's some capacity for my staff to take this part of it over. So I think there's some abilities to address number two or number one. Number two, what is the realistic assessment of your organization? Um, 
you know, when you're looking at getting an adverse audit opinion and the complexities of GAP, the um, time that it takes to put this out, the time that the state auditors in here, the costs, it, are we getting, are we, are we paying, saving too, not enough money and giving up too much? And I, I don't believe that's the case when you look at us compared to everybody else. So I, I, I think two is addressed, but I'd certainly be able to um, address specific questions on that. And three, what is, you know, being good stewards of public funds, what are we doing and how do we identify those gaps? Again, we're gonna continue reporting or allocating is just the state audit report. This is all about the state audit report. It's all about the 45 pages they want versus the 100 plus we're giving them. Questions on this page? Okay, we're to the last slide. Real quick. Wait, 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 this is Pat. Hi, Pat. I actually have um, maybe a couple of comments and a question. My question is what is involved in converting to this method of accounting? Is it huge? If I miss that, I apologize. But as far as staff time and record keeping, what's involved? I could tell you I've talked to a couple other cities and what is involved can to a person told me the same thing. The amount of time to convert back to cash at the beginning of the year for this one-time change is less time than they spent reviewing the gap reports that they turned into the state auditor. Okay. So that's an efficiency thing right there. Will, will there be a little bit of a pain point? Yeah. Um, staff's ready to roll up their sleeves and do this because they realize the efficiencies that it'll create and the cost savings to the city while still providing the transparency. And we're able to do that right now, given the cash constraints that we have, no yeah. pun intended with cash accounting versus resources, but it's, it's worth the effort right now to do that. Yes. Okay. Um, my second, that was a question. My second comment is, I will always defer to the opinion of the professionals. And in that case, Mike, that would be you. And it sounds like you are an advocate for changing over to this method of accounting. Is that yeah. correct or no? Yeah, I, I, I think it benefits everybody. There, there, there is some disadvantages, but I think the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. Um, a lot of the technical accountants that like to look at these reports and you know see what's going on, they're going to feel a little let down and um, they can certainly ask questions and we can give them the extra information. But um, for the banks, for the grantors, and for the average citizen picking this up and saying what's going on in the city of Pullman, I think this is a way more um, accessible report. Okay. Thank you for that. And then my last comment, and I think I would go back to your previous slide, and that was how would that either adversely or negatively affect our audits going forward in the future? I, I think it'll help with our audits going forward in the future. It'll assure us that we can, with our staff, that we can, um, go ahead and produce these reports in a timely manner. I think the depth and the breadth that we are reporting is more than reasonable for a city and a staff our size. Um, we're not a Seattle, we're not a King County. Um, we, there's a lot of complexities there that they have reporting for that we wouldn't affect us, but we still have to report under the, those methods. Okay. That that's the sum total of what I had to say about this, and I appreciate your comments. Thank you. I heard another question right before Pat. Uh, anyone yeah, else? That that was me, Nathan Weller here. Um, so, Mike, I had a question regarding. <clears throat> you know, you discussed about CIP having sat on that board, and I know uh, there's a couple council members right now sitting on that, <clears throat> but also uh, community members. Um, how does that affect that role? Because I would be kind of concerned if if suddenly it's it's 
affecting the structure of the uh, CIP, especially with uh, community members serving on there as well? Uh, quite the opposite. I think that that board can, you know, last year was my first year on that board and we were so hyper-focused on year one that looking at years two, three, four, five, six kind of became an afterthought where I think here's a really good opportunity to get a hold of that CIP process, talk about projects in years two, three, four, five, six, start planning for them appropriately, and then um, each year adjusting. Did the items from year three make it into year two? Or did something change like what we're experiencing right now and it stayed in year three? Or, hey, because of the regulations or because of a grant, we could take these year five items and move them into year two. I think it'll give us a, this is a great opportunity and uh, Cache County gives us a better chance to look at the uh, capital purchase more holistically. Great, great. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, Mike. I'll do last slide here. So it attached as part of your packet is the letter where I'm quoting this out of. And, you know, even our state auditor has said, um, you know, current reporting model needs to change because local government's taking longer to prepare the statements and at a higher cost. So not only was she saying this to Gasby in 2017, her staff is saying this to the city of Pullman in 2019. And, you know, when I look at it and they ask us to make all these changes and can start reporting cash already in some places in our report right now, making this switch to cash on the whole thing and just just makes a lot of sense to me. And the most important thing and everything I read about switching over this, this statement is it's the most appropriate basis of reporting for a government is a matter of judgment based on the needs, activity and resources of the government. So if we were the first person switching to cash, I think this would be a very difficult situation. Um, I, I think it'd be a really hard sell but we're kind of joining the masses towards uh creating these efficiencies saving these dollars providing the transparency that we need and um doing what the state auditor is even encouraging us to do other questions other comments mike you mentioned also metropolitan park district are you planning to do that the next meeting that we have on uh, may 5th yeah now that we're back um this has been kind of on hold. I didn't want to do a Metropolitan Parks District because I hadn't even presented this to council yet, but I will switch this around to fit the Metro Parks District. It's a, it makes sense to do that one as well, save money on that uh, audit as well. Okay. With, if there's no other questions, do I hear a motion on item number 13, uh, which is the resolution approving the change? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Mike, I really appreciate this. Um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe for me, uh, as a very dense finance person, um, you know, anybody else, I, I may have said, uh, no, thanks, but uh, I really appreciate your way of uh, explaining it in a way that I can understand. Um, and I certainly trust you. But, um, you know, my obligation, of course, is to the residents and to make sure that, that we're doing this in the best way. And so me being able to understand that, <clears throat> and also, um, I, of course, would tell any of these residents that have concerns, um, that they can talk to you about that. Um, but that was really helpful. Your presentation was fantastic. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Brandon. And again, the presentation is super abbreviated. I, I really push you towards the memo and to the public watching the memo as part of the um, council packet. You can access it as well. Um, it, it really lays out more of the stuff and especially side by side. So you can, you can look at the pros and the cons and the advantages and the disadvantages. So with that, do I hear a motion on item number 13? Move to adopt yeah. R-23-20. Al and second. second. Was that Brandon for second? Uh, D, I'll, go, I'll defer to you, you have it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Okay. With Thank that, you, Council. I'll bring it back a little abbreviated for Metro Parks next time. Okay. With that, we now move to the regular agenda. First item is a mo uh, motion to ratify the March 12th, 2020 emergency declaration. We go to our city attorney, Laura McAloon.
Thank you, Mayor. Um, the declaration of emergency was issued on March 12, 2020 by the mayor under his um, authority under RCW 3852-020. It has gone on for longer than 30 days. Um, so even though it's not clearly called out in the, um, the statute, the process at the state level is that the two uh, legislative heads of each of the houses of the legislature uh, took action to ratify the governor's declarations after 30 days. So my recommendation was that we bring this declaration to the city council to be ratified as well. Questions of Laura. So how, how long will this go now? This will go until it's re rescinded. And okay. it, it would have gone until it was rescinded anyway. If you look at the um, proclamation, section five says it will take effect on my signature and will remain in effect until I rescind it in writing and with public notice. So that rescission will be based on what happens in the state, um, what actions the mayor takes, or I'm sorry, the governor takes, whether there's any reason um, to keep it in effect. Part of that will depend on what uh, the governor does with the Open Public Meetings Act resolution or proclamation. Um, 20, proclamation 20-28 was supposed to expire at midnight on the 23rd, I believe it was, last, last Thursday night, and the mayor extended it or the, pardon me, the governor extended it um, to end co coexistent with the stay home, stay healthy order. So it's now been extended to May 4th. So I'm not sure whether the governor intends, I don't know what the governor is going to do with the OPMA, but if 20-28 doesn't stay into place, we can go back to um, either normal or if he keeps the same restrictions that are in the stay home, stay healthy order, uh, which simply says that we have to have meetings this way um, and recommends that you not take any action um, on anything that normally requires public input. So for example, public hearing um, tied related items. Um, so it's, it's really just up in the air. I, I can't tell you what they're going to, what the governor is going to do. And again, we do have a meeting scheduled on May 5th. We should probably hear by that time, perhaps mm -hmm. where he's going next. Actually, uh, I got a news release this afternoon, late this afternoon, that the governor's chief of staff said that they were hoping to make that announcement this week still, so that we would know before May 4th. Any other questions of Laura? Then do I hear a motion on this to ratify the March 12th, 2020 emergency declaration? So, so moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? With that, we now move to item number two, which is what I think a lot of people have been uh, following. And a lot of us have had some experience and we're going to talk about a roundabout. But first of all, let's go to Kevin Gardas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the intersection of Northeast Terreview Drive and North Fairway Drive is currently a two-way stop controlled intersection. Traffic volumes have been steadily increasing at this intersection over time. And there are several more private development projects in the vicinity that will likely come online in the next few years. This intersection is close to meeting warrants for an all-stop intersection, which is less than ideal from a traffic flow standpoint as it adds delay. When considering alternatives to an all-stop intersection, a traffic signal or a roundabout are potential options. In recent years, roundabouts have been gaining favor as an alternative to traffic signals, since they typically have less severe accidents and traffic signals and lower overall costs, especially in the area of long-term operation and maintenance costs. They also work fine in power outages. A roundabout at this intersection is included in the city's currently approved capital improvement program. Uh, some initial preliminary engineering work has been completed to confirm that a roundabout is an appropriate solution for this intersection. 
Staff is planning to have a grant application ready to submit to TIB in August to fund up to 85% of the construction costs for a roundabout at this intersection. In order to complete conceptual design work to support a grant application, staff solicited proposals from qualified firms. Four proposals were received with parametrics um, being selected by the committee. A scope and budget have been negotiated with parametrics and are attached to the en engineering services agreement as exhibit A. Funding for this project is from the street fund. Uh, we did give some thought to postponing this project due to the potential revenue impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of the reasons we decided to proceed are, uh, there are no general fund dollars in this project. We think we have a good shot at um, being successful with the TIB grant application. Uh, during the last downturn in 2008 and 2009, uh, Public Works pivoted to doing more city projects. Um, and this is kind of typical during downturns. When times are good, we spend a majority of our time on development related activities. Uh, so it allows us to catch up with some city project when the city project when there's a lull in development. This project would bring in grant dollars and help support construction activity and associated sales tax revenue in Pullman and support the local construction industry. And finally, the area surrounding the roundabout is experiencing growth, including additional housing units, uh, perhaps some commercial right there at the intersection, and the recently finished runway realignment project and future new terminal that will increase traffic volumes. So um, we are recommending proceeding with this and I'd be happy to answer any questions the council has. And you mentioned during the last downturn, I remember we got some Obama money that came through and helped us on a number of projects after that 2008 recession. And this will also help us in that regard. I do serve on TIB and we've already heard that we're taking some shorts uh, on this uh, problem too with COVID-19. So we're hoping that money would still be available. But I think uh, last I heard was there's at least a $10 million hit on uh, funding for TIB right now. So with that, questions of uh, Kevin. Yes, uh, Mayor. Eileen. We'll go to Eileen and then we'll go to Dan. Yeah, I've got quite a few things and we can bounce back and forth. Um, just as you just indicated, Mayor, um, this refers to a hard deadline of August 15. Are any hard deadlines still in effect, um, considering the, the circumstances that uh, we are in as a, as a state and, a, and as a city and as a nation? Um, the timeline on this feels a bit tight whether this is a hard deadline or no. Uh, the Center Street um, project took six months. This feels a little tight. So I don't know that we, I'm not comfortable necessarily charging into this thing to the tune of $70,000 when we don't know that that August 15 deadline it even still is, has any meaning. Um, if I'll try to answer the question, Eileen. I think you know, the best information we have right now is, and we've reached out to TIB and talked to them a few times. Their executive director was here and visited with staff in February. Um, it's unknown, but I think, you know, we, we would proceed with the work up to getting it ready for a TIB application. If that changes, if their money isn't available, then we're not going to go any further with the project. We would have it ready to apply for a grant at whatever time funding becomes available. And perhaps funding may not be available with TIB. I mean, I, I think that's not certain, but um, that's certainly within the realm of possibility. But there may be stimulus money. There may be other things that are available that we could apply for if we have a what's called a shovel-ready project that's ready to go, so. And Ashley Provard, our TIB uh, executive director, when he met with all of us, uh, did mention that we haven't had a TIB project for a while doesn't necessarily mean we're prioritized, but it's pretty darn close to the fact that we haven't been there for a while. Uh, that also moves us up on the, in terms of requests. Dan, records. Um, Kevin, this is a question for you, and this might be a little bit of a curveball, but um, in looking at this intersection versus other intersections that might be suitable for a roundabout, what, what can you tell us about kind of the, the priority uh, decision making over this, this location? versus another location that I know I've talked about in the past with, with people about roundabouts being out, uh, you know, the, the intersection of Airport Road with, with Terraview. Um, 
what, what can you talk about that? Um, sure. Uh, we've had quite a bit of, um, I would say, public comment on this intersection over the last few years. Um, there have been accidents there, uh, near misses. It's a heavily traveled pedestrian corridor because people cross that cross uh, Terreview there from apartment land and the traffic going east west doesn't stop. There's no, it's not stop controlled. So um, during, during peak rush hour times, it can be somewhat difficult to, for a car or a vehicle to get out on the Terreview. So it's been on our radar for a while and we've actually started looking at warrants for the all stop. Um, so it's just been a high priority for us. Um, the intersection at um, Airport Road and Terreview is also on our radar to do a, 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 a roundabout. The thing that makes Terreview and um, North Fairway a good candidate is we have the required right-of-way there to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we don't have sufficient right-of-way, but here we think we do. If we do need additional right away, it would be a very small amount that we probably would ask WSU for because they own the property on the south side. Um, and there aren't a lot of environmental issues associated with it. The location, so it's a fairly straightforward, easy engineer, easier engineering project. At Airport Road and Terreview, there's a creek there. There's going to be environmental issues and permitting that we have to deal with it's going to be a lot more complicated and take a lot more time. So the idea was to look at a location that made sense for a roundabout based on topography and right away um, that was on our radar for needing to do some improvements um, that could be somewhat put together fairly quickly to get to a successful TIB uh, grant application. Yeah, I appreciate that. And that's kind of where, where I was thinking with where, what the, those concerns might have been. Um, I just bring up the airport road location because, you know, we've got ongoing projects out there with airport, um, with the, the, the sewer line project, and, you know, eventually we may have other projects out there with a new terminal building, and is there an opportunity there to match those up so that we're not, you know, tearing up the road to put in a sewer line and then later replacing the whole road to do a roundabout? Yeah, understood. No, I... We do have a couple utility projects. The sewer line is one. We also want to extend the city water system out to the airport, which will come from the intersection that we're talking about, uh, North Fairway and Terraview, and we'll head down Terraview to Airport Road. But I don't think either of those utility projects, there would be work we would have to undo um, if we put a roundabout in there. Okay, thank you. You're okay with that one? Okay. And uh, Yes, and we're hoping that's going to be part of the airport's going to be part of the complete streets. And I know the airport will be putting in a large uh, Air Pullman Moscow Regional Airport sign near that intersection mm -hmm. as it gets along. So, uh, and there's been a couple of comments, incidentally, uh, from our council. And we have uh, MNO is going to be working on some signage during this week and some other weeks for turn signals for the, uh, the airport signs that say turn right here for the airport. So that, that's coming as well. Uh, Al Sorensen, you're next. Oh, you cut out there. Okay. So, uh, you know, we've been talking about maybe getting a roundabout in town for a while. And uh, this, this location uh, is almost perfect for a uh, sample roundabout. Uh, you know, it's plenty big. Kevin, with the right of way and everything else, um, I, I do know that there's recently been a an accident where someone went through the stop sign and broadsided a car, and there have been multiple other uh, incidents there uh, or close calls. Um, I, I completely agree with you. We don't want to stop traffic on Terraview because that is a main pipeline for the employees out at at SEL. Um, the, the concern though that I have a little bit right now, and I just wanna hear you say it again, uh, going along with Eileen, one of the things is, you know, about $70,000 to do something like this right now is now the time to spend $70,000 on something like this, or should we, uh, you know, delay for a little bit until we know what's going on. But you seem to sound like the money is there, whether we 
can we move it from there? I mean, I, I'm concerned about spending seventy thousand dollars right now. Yeah, understood. Um, I look at it as an investment. I think the the um, street fund can certainly afford this. You know, maybe in the next six months we'll find out that revenues have really dropped off, and we're going to have to take some more drastic actions. But um, my feeling is that the street fund could could do this without a, a huge um, hiccup or hardship. Um, so that's that's my thought. Um, we could we could wait, but you know, again, it's a way of this is a project that we've already kind of mapped out. Just the timing's a little bad with the COVID nineteen and potential revenue hit. But um, as I mentioned earlier, we tend to pivot towards doing more city projects so we can get caught up on that stuff as we get behind when development is really go, 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 which it's been the last you know, five, six, seven years. Yeah, yeah. hey, Mike, uh, street would it be, is Mike, would it be possible? The okay. Al? Mike, would it be, is, is it possible that we might, at some point, if we get in a emergency mode, uh, be moving money around from different uh, street funds or whatever to other funds that we have that might need the money? Uh, yeah, that's absolutely a possibility to look at interfund loans. And um, I was just starting to write an email, so thank you for bringing this up. The balance from the airport to the utility fund right now is $2,645,111.38. Um, we have sent out several um, requests for reimbursement on closing grants from the FAA, so we expect that number to go down very quickly. Um, I, I'll talk to Tony tomorrow and see what the, really the outstanding balance is and not dollars in transit. But with the balance in utility funds, uh, once this is paid back and what Kevin's still trying to do, there, there's, there's a decent reserve out there. Um, again, we're, I'm concerned about what a relapse would look like in the fall and if we would need to touch those monies then. Thank you. Yep. If I could add something to that. If, if there was an interfund loan, um, it probably would come from the utility fund, not from the street fund. Okay. Brandon, next. Yeah. Kevin, thank you. Um, I'm reading through this uh, parametrics document, and and I, I did see the, um, the quote you had in the Daily News uh, regarding uh, bikes and things like that. And what they had was it says the conceptual level design will include pedestrian bicycle measures, um, but it doesn't go into... Uh, much more detail about that. Uh, I, you know, I know there's a difference between roundabouts and traffic circles and things like that, uh, but we do have a lot of land here. So how, how big is this um, anticipated? Uh, you know, we, we obviously don't have conceptual designs at this point, um, but have they given you any indication of what that might, um, might look like in terms of width? And uh, I guess the second part of it is, so, so just to make sure it's not a bridge, bridge to nowhere as we continue uh, you know, fostering this um, complete streets uh, mentality. Um, you know, what's the uh, what's the likelihood that we can look at um, pedestrian friendly things outside of this traffic circle that are or roundabout that are right there in the immediate area? Because one of the concerns that residents had when um, they talked about this was crossing a street where cars are going 35 miles an hour. Uh, so do we have the option to maybe traffic calm, uh, slow that down a little bit? Um, what are some of the other options that we may have? And maybe that's looking too far out, but um, I, I, it would look a little goofy to have the, um, you know, bike lane at the start of this and at the end of this and then nothing. So uh, just curious uh, what, what other discussions you may have had um, on what, what we would value and hope that they, you know, that would be part of this. Uh, sure. Uh, good question. Um, the definitely the conceptual design and the final design would include um, uh, provisions to accommodate bicycles and pedestrians. Um, there is a trail that runs now along um, the south side of Terraview, so we would plan for that to continue across that intersection. It doesn't currently go very far on the west side, but uh, the idea would be that eventually that would continue on the west side. So we would make provisions to uh, consider the trail traffic. As far as the pedestrians, mostly crossing north-south, 
Uh, we've talked about potentially there would be middle uh, refuges in the center of each of the, the, the four, four legs. Um, and potentially we would put in the rapid flashing uh, beacons if we thought it was warranted. I mean, that's something that will get flushed out with the design. Uh, but we've talked about a number of options. As far as size goes, um, right now the, the width, the diameter, I don't remember the exact numbers, I'm thinking it's something like 125 feet, kind of would just barely fit within the 80 foot right away for both of those streets. So if you imagine 80 feet in each direction, a circle just plop right down there so it's touching the four corners of, of the intersection is about what it would look like. And as far as uh, slowing, it would be designed to slow cars down as they enter it and traverse the. But, and, and, and I would imagine, I, I don't know how much Really, I don't know how much expertise Parametrics has in, in roundabouts, but um, I would assume that they are uh, up to speed on some modern designs that would allow our emergency vehicles, if they needed to, to go right over the top of these things, right? right. Yes, that's correct. Um, we would make them mountable. Um, we, in our discussions with um, DOT, they're, you know, they d definitely have a preference for roundabouts now. They put these roundabouts in on 55 mile per hour highways. Um, they're all mountable. You know, I think it would be, we would certainly have part of it be mountable, but I think it would be nice. You know, this is kind of an entrance to WSU. It would be nice if there was a little bit of low landscaping, you know, maybe a little bit of artwork there potentially. I mean, that's uh, off in the future, assuming there's money for that. Um, as far as parametric, parametrics expertise, one of the reasons we selected them is they have an engineer on staff that's designed like 30 of these in the state of Washington. Okay. So we felt very comfortable with their expertise. The, the one they always show us is 395 up uh, at Costco up on it. Uh, WashDOT happens to love that one. They show us that example. I think we saw that here in Pullman here recently in one of the presentations we had. Who else would like to make comments? Can I see, Al? Need to unmute. The speed limit that uh, at that intersection is is 25 now, Brandon. If you were wondering, it, it goes from 35 down to 25 before you hit the intersection. Okay. No, um, I appreciate that. It, it probably is cars coming from, you know, airport road side of things. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think we need to really be careful about with this is you know the the center of the island design standards that we're going to do and we've got to be really careful with this uh and make sure that what we do with it kevin is something that works and i i hope that in in some of our research and things we maybe check with other cities or something where they've done some of these and then found that you know maybe that didn't exactly work we need to do it this way so um you know, I, I think this is, uh, I, I, I do like the idea of a roundabout. Um, I'm gonna have to get used to going the other direction since I was in Europe a year ago going the other way. But, uh, you know, I found the roundabouts to be just a, a, a tremendous way to, to get around without having to stop. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm completely in support of, of doing this project. My, my concern back to this one more time is, is the funding of it right at this moment. And I'll just leave it there. Any other comments from the council? Uh, Eileen. Yeah, I'm I'm just real hesitant to be spending this money right now, especially up against a, a, a deadline that we don't even know exists. Uh, there seems to be some some vague notions about whether TIB is gonna is gonna be functioning in the way it's functioning now. Um, and again the design uh, the parametrics document references the uh, Morrison and Mayerling Center Street control um, documents. Those were neighborhood roundabouts. Those were not arterial streets. Those were neighborhood roundabouts. And this is not a neighborhood roundabout. This is a, this is a traffic circle. And we're going to need truck aprons. And we're going to have to be very conscious of how we of how we put this thing together. I'm I, as everybody knows. I, you know, full disclosure. I'm not a big fan of roundabouts. But I think this is a spot to do one to do it correctly 
but I don't know that this gives us enough time frame to do this correctly and to do it within the constraints of what's going on with our economy right now. I just think that we should put this on hold, do a really good job of it. And um, that's, that's what I would encourage at this time. Other comments? So we've heard one that's talked about putting on hold, uh, others that say, you, could, you know, it's a different bucket in terms of money. Um, any other comments from Consul? Mayor? Yes. This is Dan. Uh, Kevin, uh, or maybe this is a question for Mike, but uh, if, if we were to go forward, if we go forward to this project, we, we do the $70,000, did the conceptual designs. If we got the TIB grant, what would be the, you know, I know that's part of the, the cost estimates as part of the, the what, we're, what we're paying for now, but can you give that kind of a ballpark of what, what would be the cost of that project and what would be the potential um, revenue to the city in terms of sales tax on if we have a local business that is is buying and, and purchasing materials locally? What, what is the type of impact on that in terms of revenue the city would receive back from a project of this scope? Um. Probably have on the second part of that, Dan. I think Michael have to chime in if he, if he can come up with something. Um, assuming we get through the conceptual work and apply for the grant, and we get the grant, um, and maybe the grants, you know, anywhere from five hundred thousand to seven hundred thousand, depending on you know what the cost estimate comes in. TIB would potentially fund up to eighty-five percent of that. So that would be grant funds that would come directly to the city and be spent here within the city. As far as what the sales tax revenue and potential benefit from buying materials here in town, uh, Mike, if you have comment on that, uh, you know, we're all ears. Sure, I would uh, temper this an awful lot like the airport project where they're, you know, everything that's coming into that airport, all the asphalt, all the pipe and everything, that's, destination-based sales tax that comes to the city of Pullman. Great. Al Sorensen. I got just got a, another quick one. Uh, with the grant, if we get approved for the grant, would that even backdate into the uh, design part of this? Would we get 85% of the 70,000 or is it for future? It's for future. In, in the past, um, we used to be able to count the earlier work, but uh, EIB's rules have changed more recently, so we wouldn't be able to get paid for that. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Is there anyone who would like to make a motion on this resolution authorizing the execution of the engineering services agreement? Move to adopt. Uh, <laughs> move to adopt this. Okay. Do I hear a second? <clears throat> second. Okay. Nathan, second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. I see one no. And D, you've got that as far as you're concerned. Okay. Al, Al, was, Mayor, no well. Al was muted, but he, he, he was a no as well. Al, you were a no? Yeah. Okay. So we I have two no's as well. So we yeah. have two no's. Five approved. Just want to double check, D. That's what you've got. Okay. Very good. With that, we now move to new business tonight. And we did have a notice on our website, also in our packet, about letting us know if there was going to be new business that came up. And the deadline was five o'clock today. We did not have any new notice, but Adam has an item that is a new notice that uh, new business to come before us tonight. Adam? Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, there's a couple items I just want to briefly mention. One is that uh, in, in light of the planning director's retirement that's uh, supposed to happen on June 26th, uh, we're getting ready to put out the, the job posting for, for that position. Um, we're going to be changing the title a little bit to um, reflect what most, most cities are transitioning to. It'll be the community development director. Um, they'll still be uh, in charge of, of planning. And uh, as we as we kind of flesh that out a little bit, one, there, there'll be some things that do have to come forward to the, the council to uh, modify the code a little bit. So um, we're, we're looking at putting uh, the buildings team 
Uh, so building inspections would be housed in, in that department. And assuming we can find the right person who has the right background, we'll also be putting uh, economic development into that, that section as well. Um, but that will, that'll come forward later. It's not something that we have to rush into. I want to see what the, the market looks like and, and see who we can, we can find for, for that position. Our, our goal is certainly to have um, no, no lag time between the, the hiring of someone new and, and uh, Pete's retirement, um, but we're also putting plans in place in, in case we need to uh, hire someone in, in an interim basis. So uh, it's a critical position. We want to make sure that we're uh, giving it all the attention that we can and, and making sure that moves forward smoothly. Um, I know that's brief, but are there any questions uh, about that transition or that position? Yeah. Uh, Adam, so I appreciate you mentioning the code. Uh, it's my understanding that the, um, the position descriptions are an authority of the council, even if the hiring is not. Uh, is the position description for this, is this something that you have, uh, you'll, you'll propose or, or give to council so we can look that over? Uh, yeah, we certainly can. Laura, did you have anything you need to add for? Uh, there is language in the city code um, regarding the planning director position and what the duties are. Um, so the, the duties aren't going to change. So right now, just so I can clarify, the duties won't change for the planning part. And then we will bring it forward for any changes with, with regards to um, if they will be supervising uh, building inspections and um, uh, economic development. So Kevin's been working on that and he'll he'll have that ready to go. So yes, you will have approval of that. Thank you. Um, the other item that I wanted to mention that I'll, I'll bring forward um, I, probably next week uh, is the extension of the court contract. Uh, that's been something that we haven't been able to bring back the um, the study to you all just yet. We'll probably have to do it remotely, obviously, with the way that things are, have changed. So the court study has been completed. I want to make sure you guys have a, a formal presentation there. Um, any, any conversation that goes around uh, creating our, our own court would take uh, multiple years anyways. Um, and given the fact that we're at the mid-year point, uh, the I, I did reach out to the county and ask if they'd be open to just uh, carrying it forward on another one year increment. And they, they have said that they'd agree to that. In fact, they've approved it in one of their county commission meetings and, and even sent over the extension to me. Um, so I'll bring that forward to, to have a discussion with, with you all uh, at the next meeting and um, see whether or not that's something that you agree would be a, a, a good fit to go forward. But honestly, the bandwidth to focus on, um, uh, the, the court from our staff side has just not been there. So I, I will recommend that we extend it another year just so that we can have, uh, have more time to really be thorough about that. And uh, those are the only two items that I had, Mayor. Any other questions of uh, Adam on these two? And as far as we- Dan, Dan did, it looked like, or maybe just new business. No, I had just new business. Thank you. Okay. Any others on this? Okay. Uh, Dan, new business. Um, I just wanted to bring up something that uh, uh, I've, I've talked with a couple of community members about, and I think some of the communications that have come in in the last week or so from from some residents um, in, in talking about, you know, planning for or discussing for when the governor starts to relax some of the stay home orders, um, how, how they're going to do that maybe in phases. But uh, an idea has been floated that that I kind of liked that uh, you know maybe the city could do a call out for feedback from the community on what they would like to see in terms of what would make them feel safe resuming activities in Pullman whether it's with the city or with businesses you know if we could compile something that's that's a uh, kind of a, a compilation of community feedback on on what measures they'd like to see put in place um, to resume activities. Um, I think that could be something that could be beneficial for a lot of people. I think it could be beneficial to residents to give them some input, give them a piece of you know this this uh, human moment that we're kind of all experiencing, um, and and uh, a, a way to participate in the resolution of it. But also, uh, it could be beneficial for our business owners as well um, to get some some consistent feedback from the community on 
what what is it that the community is wanting to see or need in terms of resuming those activities? Other comments on that? And yeah, Mayor, I, I think that's really important what Dan, Dan is mentioning. Uh, there are a lot of businesses that are open right now. They've been deemed essential, but they've seen a, uh, a market drop off uh, in in people giving their business. And, and um, that's not just, uh, you know, WCU going online um, issues. Uh, because there, of course, there are a number of people who just want to feel more safe. So I, I think, you know, we can certainly discuss, uh, you know, and take a an approach of of a carrot rather than a stick with some of the business owners to, you know, to say here here are the things right that residents are saying, and you know, if, if they see that that it's going to affect their business positively or negatively, they might on their own accord um, do those things because they they need to get ramped back up, you know. So. Um, I appreciate Councilman Records for bringing that up, and you know I don't know at what level we can have those discussions or solicit that feedback. Maybe that's something that um, you know Jennifer Hackman can can help with to to find out what um, uh, what folks are expecting, you know, in terms of of health. Um, but maybe we can get get those folks who. Uh, a primary concern is the public health, um, even if we are you know trying to open businesses back up. Okay, any other comments? Any other new business? Seeing none, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? With that? I think, I yes. think does D, mean, D need confirmation on who did that? Yeah. Who? Okay. who I know I seconded, but some, somebody else did also, and I don't know who moved. I, yeah, I moved. Brandon made a motion who, and made the second. Who moved? Brandon. 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 He did. Okay. Who moved? Thank you. Okay. You got it? Thank you. Because I know on board docs, you actually get the vote, so I didn't know if you had got it. <laughs> okay. I got it. Thank okay. you. Thank you all. We're adjourned. The next meeting will be no. May 5th. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Be healthy. Thank you.